What if all the middle episodes of a David Tennant series of Doctor Who were released all at once? What if David Tennant had gotten another series of Doctor Who after 2008 series 4, after his tears in the rain moment, but before his grand finale? What if it was made 10 years after David Tennant had left the role? I am, of course, describing Dalek Universe, Volume 2, the second of the three releases that make up this audio-only series of stories that see David Tennant's 10th Doctor sent back to a time before his era-defining Last Great Time War, where he has adventures with Anya Kingdom, the sort of former policewoman with a complicated relationship with the Doctor, and Mark Seven, the polite android with a taste for killing Daleks. Dalek Universe was conceived of as like a series, like a TV series, and that's also how it's been promoted, and it's what the episodes are like. They're not as completely super standalone as some audio stories sometimes are, but they're not like some ultra serialized project, like some television either. They're pretty much like how David Tennant's actual TV episodes of Doctor Who were. Episodes are mostly doing their own thing, focused on their own single adventures, but there is a clear kind of flow and momentum and progression throughout the series. But for all that TV similarity, it's certainly not being released as David Tennant's TV episodes were, as TV series don't tend to doll out their episodes in three separate installments of three episodes at a time. But that's not uncommon in the world of Doctor Who audio stories. And so today we'll be looking at this second volume in general, as well as having specific discussions on these middle episodes of Dalek Universe. Episode 4, Cycle of Destruction, Episode 5, The Trojan Dalek, and Episode 6, The Lost. And we'll also be looking at an odd little curiosity, The Destroyers, the unproduced pilot script for an American Dalek spin-off by Terry Nation that features some of the same characters and concepts as Dalek Universe. Now, in our previous discussion on Dalek Universe 1, we first dug into the concepts behind Dalek Universe, its development, its characters, its premise, its context, the promotion of the series, all that fascinating kind of foundational stuff. And then after that, we opened ourselves up to spoilers for those first three episodes as we went and had specific discussions on them. In this video, we'll also have a more general spoiler-free conversation about this second volume and where Dalek Universe stands now, before having a clear spoiler warning and then moving into specific spoiler discussions of episodes 4, 5, 6 and The Destroyers. And this is all chapterized on YouTube, so you can get a bit timey-wimey with your listening too, if you wish. Last time doing the discussing was myself, Neo from Australia, joined by Looms from Ireland and Dilb from England. Today it won't just be that trio again, as we will also be joined by Nate Bumber, our American friend who, would it be accurate to say, is pretty clued into a lot of the things Dalek Universe is dealing with? Yeah, I'm a big fan of, well first it's great to be back, but I'm a huge fan of the 60s Dalek stories and uh mark seven really came into his own in the 70s annuals but yeah uh the kingdoms and the sss and the very first technically first appearance of mark seven that was all in the 60s stuff that's like my favorite era of the classic series and so i was extremely excited when they announced that they'd kind of be returning to that terry nation vision uh in this especially with the 10th Doctor, which is just a great crossover between some of my favourite characters. Yeah. Mm, so we're very happy to have you, as some of that stuff <laughs> confounded us a little more in the first box set. So <laughs> this, is, this is a very good mix to have this time. Uh, so to start off with, I'd want to ask you, Nate, uh, us other three already had a chance to speak to this in our first discussion, so I'd like to know, is there anything else that specifically interested you about Dalek universe in the first place besides just mixing this 60s Dalek mania stuff with the super popular 10th Doctor? Yeah, I was really interested to see how they would uh, return to and update this material, especially since um, I think we might we might mention this uh, throughout, but uh, the Destroyers, that Terry Nation spin-off series that he intended to actually take the Daleks away from Doctor Who. And the main characters of that would have been Sarah Kingdom and Mark Seven. 
So, you know, we, we kind of got some previews of that, even though the series didn't get made in the annuals, as I mentioned. So I was kind of, I came into this thinking, okay, this is like the Destroyers. This is like, if that was fleshed out into a series, it's no coincidence that we have Mark Seven back. It's no coincidence that we have a kingdom, even if it's not uh, Sarah Kingdom. I went in to Dalek Universe 1 not having heard any, I intentionally didn't listen to the previous Anya Kingdom stories because I just wanted to kind of imagine it as Sarah Kingdom and see the degree to which that would fit in. And the answer is that it doesn't really. It doesn't really fit in. Uh, they're very much from the same archetype of character, but there's so many references. It's nice, though, that Big Finish has taken one of their original characters and really brought her into her own. Yeah, I guess those are those were my main thoughts on the on the first box set and the series as a whole. Definitely, definitely one of the the projects I've been most excited for in Big Finish in the last several years. On the topic of getting a second box set now, Dilb and Looms. Just speaking generally, did you prefer this box set or the first one? I I preferred this one. Looms preferred this one. What about you, Dilb? I preferred this one too, yeah. Why did you guys prefer this one? So did I, for the record. (laughs) And I. Yeah, I just thought, I guess it was just more dramatic, really, except apart from that really exciting cliffhanger in the first part of Dalek Universe 1, there wasn't really much that was, like, genuinely thrilling, but I think especially the uh, latter two parts of Dalek Universe 2 were really quite exciting. Yeah, I have to agree with that. I I felt completely different. Yeah, I think... When you only have three stories in these box sets, having a two-parter like the first box set did, even if it's good, it kind of takes a lot of oxygen out of the room because then you just have one other story. But this time it's like three actual episodes. I was able to get into that a lot lot more. And I found, obviously, with the first box set, there was that big spoiler and Twitter was all going, all hype, hype, hype for the first box set. So you've got this sort of standard in your head that you're trying to listen for. Whereas with the second one, there wasn't as much hype online. And I was just expecting, sort of like what we said earlier, a mid-season, so nothing much is going to happen. Or like the classic Who meme, where you can skip the middle parts. Hmm. I was just expecting, yeah, this is going to be mostly standalone stories with no real plot development. And without getting into any spoilers, I was pleasantly surprised with that. So I think that upped it as well in my head. Yeah, it's, I think more happens in this than in the middle stretches of some actual <laughs> New Who series. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting because yeah, the third box set for this, the one that is yet to come out, has Davros and River Song on the cover. So it's got these huge promotional elements and the first box set had the spoiler stuff. But this one, it just kind of sits in the middle. And so I was, I'm interested that we all, that we all preferred it because I think that speaks to... I guess what it was doing. It doesn't lend itself to his, these like big social media reactions and hashtags yeah. or whatever. It's more just because there's more kind of substance to it, especially the third part. Yeah. I did see quite a bit of, but not as much as obviously the first box set, but for the final story in this, there was a lot of attention online, certain accounts comparing it to a certain other story. Yeah, yeah, but that's, I, I saw that too. I think that's interesting though, because it's not, like for the first box set, the social media noise was more this shocking thing happens. And for the third box set, at least so far, it's these characters are in it. Wow. But this one, it's more like, wow, this sixth episode is really good. Yeah. Which is a, a kind of a different social media noise. Yeah. The first box set felt like it, this is to get the average Doctor Who fans into it. Whereas the second box set seemed to be more big Finnish fans talking about it. Yeah, for sure. Rather than just 10 Doctor fans, this is our first box set. Wow, this felt more like, oh yes, I, I've listened to this and this is this story reminds me of this story from the early 2000s. This is why this is great. As much as it's bringing the 10th Doctor into the world of the 60s, Terry Nation stuff, it's also more than any previous box set you know, the first three volumes with his TV companions and River. Um, It's more, this feels like he's really been brought into Big Finish as well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely got the feeling that with the big cliffhangers and plot hooks in the first box set, with this one, they felt they had more freedom. Like, okay, the audience is bought in. 
they're invested in the story, we can spend some more time actually exploring these characters and going in pretty interesting directions. I think this is a pretty companion-focused box set. The first episode within it, so the fourth episode of Dalek Universe overall, it feels very much to me the companion focus episode for Mark 7, the way that the preceding episode that finished off the last box set ostensibly was for Anya Kingdom. And the sixth episode here, the one with the gorgeous cover, I feel like that's the most character focused story this series has done so far. Now both Anya and Mark are of course space security service agents, they're both kind of military agents of the 40th century. And ostensibly you can come to Dalek Universe 1 completely clean and fresh and without previous knowledge of any other Doctor Who what's its. But both Anya and Mark also existed previously in other not TV Doctor Who things. For Mark 7 it was 1960s Dalek stories, Dalek comics by Terry Nation like Nate talked about earlier. As well as the pilot script for a Dalek spin-off Terry Nation tried to develop in the 1960s which Big Finish eventually repurposed as the one-off audio story The Destroyers. In the first volume, we discussed Mark 7 kind of in terms of the science fiction trope of the prim and proper android, the dutiful android, the C-3PO figure, the Star Trek data figure. And for Anya Kingdom, she comes from, well, Tom Baker's fourth Doctor has also gotten audio takes on TV seasons, the way the tenth Doctor is getting here, and the way Torchwood has also gotten before. Anya was initially pals with Tom Baker's fourth Doctor, but in the guise of a 1970s policewoman called Anne Kelso, but that was actually a kind of construct, and she ended up actually being Anya Kingdom, a 40th century space agent. And the Doctor, certainly the 10th Doctor in this Dalek Universe series, kind of resents her for that, because he grew really attached to the 1970s and Kelso personality when he was Tom Baker. So he has this sort of tension with Anya Kingdom now. And Annie is also related to an iconic figure from the first Doctor's 1960s TV run, Sarah Kingdom. So there's a lot of continuity stuff going on with her. But, as we discussed in our discussion of the first box set, this Dalek Universe series goes to pains to try and give all the necessary context and foundation to new listeners about these characters. I mean, that's the way I've been experiencing them mostly. I would say the question is generally not... Who are these characters and what's all this continuity stuff? Because we tend to get given that information anyway, we tend to get it explained. The question is perhaps more, why in a new 10th Doctor David Tennant audio season are we using figures so steeped in all this arcane continuity? But at the end of the day, Dalek Universe, a lot of the creatives behind it talk of it as a love letter to 1960s Doctor Who, Terry Nation Doctor Who and so on. So first off, Without specific spoilers for the box sets episodes yet, how are we feeling about our companions Mark 7 and Anya Kingdom these days? Have our feelings changed since the first box set? I think with, just with like, even without volume 2, I think just with the time that's passed since volume 1, I think I've come to um, think more fondly of the two characters. But with volume 2 in mind, I think my opinion on Mark hasn't really changed, whereas Anya, I've definitely... I, th I think she's great. I just, yeah, I think she's been, she's really shined in this box set. Yeah, I think I like Mark a little bit more yeah. in this one, just be because he's got something more to do. Yeah. And he gets the episode de dedicated to him, but he's still not amazing. I do like Anya a lot now compared to before. I feel like with Mark, it's just smart to have, the Mark focused episode, just four episodes into the series. I think there's a lot of other big finish series, like the uh, the Eighth Doctor Time War ones, where it felt like it was just going on and on before ever kind of sitting down and saying, we should probably characterize this companion a little bit more. I like that in here, we very quickly got episodes three and four are meant to be. This is going into more depth with our companions, you know, before the halfway point of the series. I, I think that was smart writing. I'm glad they did that. Mm, it almost feels like episodes three and four, it's weird that there's such a big, there was like a three month gap between them. I think yeah. they'd work well yeah. in sequence. I almost had the vibe, you know, in series nine of the new Doctor Who, how we had these episodes that weren't two-parters, but they were like very linked, like the two episodes with mm. Maisie Williams and that kind of thing. I felt like to have in a row, here's Companion 1's focus story and then here's Companions 2 focus story. 
uh, and they, they even like follow immediately on from each other. It felt very much like I was meant to experience this going from one week to another, not going from like yeah. two months to another. Yeah, it felt like um, like American television programs, how if you're pilot and your first episode, your first proper episode had a real pitch to get you into it. And then they'll have the few character focused episodes. Yeah. It felt a lot like that, but strange because it had the three month gap between two of them. I think ending the first box set on kind of typical kind of cliffhanger was fine because it's the kind of thing you catch up with quickly. But there was stuff in the second box set they're referencing, and I'm like, I, I haven't heard this since a couple of months ago. Who was Arborek? I forget yeah. who you're talking about. So there was there were some aspects where I feel like I like that they're writing this like a TV season, but since you're not releasing it as one, I'm having some issues <laughs> with listening to it, how you're releasing it. For sure. And I think that's one of the places where if they were more uh, experimental with their release format, it really could have helped uh, engage the audience better. Because even though I listened to the I listened to the box sets almost uh, almost back to back because I was I was procrastinating I guess but they uh, the the way that the cliffhanger at the end of the first box set was kind of contri- well not contrived I don't want to veer too much into spoiler territory but um, it was very quickly resolved I think and that even though it it sparked the plot of the next episode. I felt like it was very shoehorned in and the transition between the two stories wasn't smooth if you listen to them back to back. So even if it was a back to back two parter, I'm not sure that would have worked either. It was just kind of a strange part way. That's an interesting point. That reminds me of on the behind the scenes disc, the direction the episode writers get from John Dorney, the script editor and a driving creative mind behind the series. Having your story be one link in a chain of a bigger story arc. Um, as a writer, you're very reliant on your script editor. And in this case, it was the marvelous uh, John Dorney to make sure you're working in the right direction. And uh, for the audience anyway, you've got to make sure it all makes sense. And it feels like it's part of a greater whole as well as being a story in its own right. So the big notes you get really are about how your story starts and how it ends, but you've also got to make sure it's sufficiently on top of what's happened previously, uh, what your character's long-term goals are, and what you might need to set up for future episodes that uh, haven't been written yet necessarily. I think the need to have the ending of your story hit specific beats to set up the next story, I think sometimes that comes across oddly as a listener when plans might change a little or the direction of the next story changes and you end up with this connective tissue that like it does firmly link two stories but it might feel kind of arbitrary beyond that as most of the rest of the stories might just end up doing their own thing so I think I can see what you mean there. On that note of episode linkages I'd be so interested to hear what it's like for anyone that doesn't listen to Dalek Universe until after the third box set is out so they can then listen to the whole nine episode series, not necessarily as like one full on binge, but without the enforced weight of months or anything like that. It'd be interesting to know how the series feels if listeners kind of listen to it as the one series unit like that. Yeah, that would be interesting. Yeah, that'd be interesting. For sure. All right, so let's get to discussing the episodes themselves now. So we are now moving into the spoiler territory where we will discuss the actual events of these Dalek Universe 2 episodes. First up is episode 4, Cycle of Destruction. It's a bit of a mystery story, meant to be giving Mark 7 more depth, explaining where it comes from, being the companion focus episode for him the way episode 3 was for Anya. There are some cute bears in this story, there's an interesting twist. Uh, I wasn't a fan of the cold open. It was one of those cold opens that just felt so perfunctory to me. Like it's the Doctor and the companion walk out on a planet and a monster roars. <gasps> Titles. I, f- I feel like the other stories <laughs> did a better job with those. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Doctor. We've got company. And there we go. Hold on, Anya. I'm coming. It's like I already have the stories. Like, you've already sold me on this. I'm invested enough to be following the range and all. But it feels kind of like rubbing it in a bit to have something just as obligatory as that it's like weirdly low-key as an opener i think which ties into again how it feels more linked to the last episode of the last box set yeah it's that funny tension again of like 
Is it a fourth episode of a series just coming out two months after the last episode? Or is it in a way kind of a first episode too, since it's what kicks off this own box set? The whole tension between the season idea and the box set releases, it really is an ongoing topic here. Mm. Yeah, it was it was definitely a very strange opening coming off that big, crazy left field cliffhanger at the end of uh, the House of Kingdom. Because, you know, it's like when they wake up, all the tension is removed. They kind of observe that, oh, no, actually, we're safe. Yeah. And so that was leaving me thinking, oh, what what's going on? <laughs> yeah, that confused me. Yeah. I, I, I didn't know. I couldn't remember fully the cliffhanger. And I, yeah. I knew in my head, okay, this happens. And then when they start this one, I think, what? What's going on? Did I like, skip forward a few minutes? or? It's it's three minutes into this, it's literal bird song like it's such a whiplash from like a crashing <laughs> ship well that depends how we're defining civilization libraries social structures kylie's deconstruction album oh, you know what i mean somewhere we can get parts and then even the monster roar i mean it's literally a bear <laughs> like and then there's jokes about honey and toast it's just like tonally this is so weird yeah i also noticed that right off the bat they um they re-established it, I, I thought it was interesting what they chose to reestablish about the characters right off the bat. Like in the very first three minutes of Cycle of Destruction, they've already made a joke about how um, how Anya was in the 1970s, yeah. which uh, I guess serves to remind, but that didn't really come into play again until the well, I guess the third the third story, The Lost, that uh, that was brought up again, but. I thought that was an interesting choice because I was thinking that after the House of Kingdom, maybe that whole plot line, all that tension was resolved. But that was a real clear way of signaling right off the bat that, oh, no, this is still relevant. You should still go back and listen to that fourth Doctor season. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's. I know we talked We talked about this at length in the, in the first box set discussion, but I just feel like I, I really like the concept of the Doctor Loki resenting her companion or at least maybe resenting them. And wanting them to be someone else, like that's that's very real. That's a really interesting character beat. Mm -hmm. But when it slides too much into remember those Tom Baker stories where Anne was a she was in the seventies and all this other stuff. It's like no, I don't remember that. I'm someone who's come in because it's the tenth Doctor. It's David Tennant. Like yeah. I haven't listened to all this other expensive box sets you're selling. I'm sorry, but yeah. So it's some it's i feel like generally the balance is okay but sometimes i feel a little on the outside and maybe the idea is to get me to go buy those tom baker box sets i'm sorry but i'm not i'm not, I'm not gonna do that so <laughs> here we are so at the moment it's just like ken's just making these needling comments just being yeah really petty and it's like i didn't even know this person i wonder if he comes off as more prickly and pricky to us because we haven't gotten attached to this mm. and Kel I haven't heard these stories with 70s Anne so I've, I've I'm attached to Anya this character I do know not Anne and so I wonder if if you've heard the Tom Baker ones whether uh, the doctor comes off as better because you would have an attachment to her as well yeah mm -hmm. or if you were like a the difference between a Rose fan and maybe a, someone who doesn't like Rose that much. Yeah. How would they yeah. see Ten's behaviour towards Martha? Yeah, yeah. Something in this story also early on I liked was the line about psychic paper only working on beings that are like sentient, that have a sense of self because it plays yeah. on their own understanding of authority. Yeah, I like that a lot. Her reaction to my psychic paper was interesting as well. How so? It works on entities with a sense of self, interpolates and reflects back their idea of authority. If she was just a bunch of scripted responses and cold logic in a human-shaped bot, well, I mean, she wouldn't see anything at all. Was that established in the TV show, or was that new? That felt new to me, and I liked it. I think it is new, yeah. It feels new to me, and but it slides in so well. Like, it just fits so well. Like, oh, of course, yeah. It's mm. totally, like, their idea of authority. Yeah, it, might, it must be new. I was watching The Empty Child yesterday, and they had the joke where Rose and Jack are passing the uh, psychic paper to each other. And the joke that, oh, Rose is, says, oh, she's single. Or she's available, very available. Yeah, yeah. That, that fit, doesn't fit in with this, but it works nicely. I, I, I like it a lot. Something else also early on uh, that plays in how we were talking about how episodes three and four feel connected was we get the stuff where uh, Maria Six is saying how people are defined by their families even if it's by opposition 
and Anya is resisting psychoanalysis and we're like swirling around this Anya family stuff again, which is exactly what episode three was all about. So again, it just felt like, remember this last week? Uh, like, a t- like a TV series would like call back to episodes in that way. Mm. And I liked how uh, the doctor made that little speculation. He was like, oh, isn't it strange that we've had two like companion family focused stories in a row? I liked that little nod toward the, yeah. toward the fourth wall, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. With the uh, Mark Seven stuff, the flashbacks we got to when like his foster parents were killed by Daleks and he's like mm-hmm. shouting and then he bashes the Dalek or he like kills the Dalek. Is this stuff from the comics? Does it fit into the comics? Was it depicted in them? How does this all play with the other Mark material? In all the other stuff, I mean, you know what the 70s annuals were like. They had a very kind of tenuous grasp on, uh, on the concept of Doctor Who. And with the Daleks ones, they were very focused on his time, not with the SSS, but with the ADF. That's the anti-Dalek force, I think. And it's very much like, oh, we're going from place to place fighting Daleks and other aliens. There aren't a lot of real character moments. Right. And I liked that uh, in the behind the scenes, Tennant mentioned he has very strong memories of the 1970s annuals. And then Mark Seven as well, who I remember from the comic strips. I I have a very vivid mental picture of Mark Seven, who doesn't look unlike Joe Sims. So uh, I I think that's uh, a rather good bit of casting there. But but it kind of made me wonder, like, what are those fond memories of Mark Seven that you have? (laughs) He's kind of a generic action hero. Yes, he's an android, and that adds some interesting elements, but there's... Uh, you know, in terms of his characterization, he's really, he's really just, uh, I, I don't have a strong opinion of him. What I thought was interesting, and I'll jump in, I'll, I'll add this, is that uh, he debuted as Agent 7 in the 1960s, I think it was the Dalek Outer Space book, and that one was all about Sarah Kingdom and the SSS from Dalek's Master Plan, and in that, he just kind of appeared in a bunch of drawings, but there wasn't really a story that featured him necessarily. And I think it's really interesting because that version of him was very different. Dark hair, you know, barely the same character. And you can tell that it was the first draft of what Terry Nation would later turn into Mark Seven uh, for the 70s annuals. So I thought it was interesting that they, the Big Finish kind of merged the two approaches. There's no mention of the ADF, at least that I noticed. And he's definitely grounded in, like, the kingdoms and the SSS uh, while still being the blonde action hero style android. Yeah. Agent 7, is. do you think that's, like, a riff on James Bond 007? Oh, that's a good point. I never thought of that. The 7 is always in quotes. You know, it's not really his name, so that totally fits. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, I, on those behind-the-scenes things, it's so funny and endearing listening to Tenet like, go on about, oh, Terry Nation invented the world. Raymond Cusack was also a huge influence. You know, he invented the Dalek <laughs> design. And then go on about how, oh, Joe Sims is actually a very accurate, you know, <laughs> casting for for Mark Seven. It's just hilarious how much of a, like, full-on Anorak superfan he, he really, really is. And I think <laughs> I think Jane Slavin says at one point that David Tennant is doing these audios, like, for the genuine love he has of Doctor Who. And I know how much it means to him. And well, obviously it means a lot to me too. So oh, I felt like a real privilege. It's, you know, he doesn't have to do it anymore. He does it for love. And um, it shows, I think. So it's it's amazing to have an actor so, in, like, so insanely into the property like this. While also being one of the most popular to do it. Yeah, yeah. It lends some kind of... Validation. Legitimacy. Validation, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if they had pitched let's return to Terry Nation's 1960s Daleks universe to any other doctor I'm not sure they would have they would have gotten as warm a reception yeah uh, an- another connection uh, to the early episodes I felt was when we get that bit of the 10th doctor in Mark's head listen it's time to wake up and that's like how in in the first box set we had uh, it was he was in Anya's head wasn't he in with the timey wimey stuff in the opening two parter. Oh yes, yes. Mm. So another little it's all it's all feeling quite linked so far. Another link, I guess, is that 
Well, we know the actress for uh, Maria Six from uh, being one of the River Songs on Doctor Who, Series Six. Let's kill Hitler. Oh, of course. Yeah. Yeah, that, that does... Well, I guess it kind of links into things because uh, River Song herself, Alex Kingston's going to be in the next box set. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I was thinking this is definitely the most ambitious alternate River Song <laughs> origin story <laughs> that we've heard yet. Something else, about halfway through in this one, we get the classic Rose reference when the Doctor's talking about how him, Anya, Margavor lost people to the Daleks. That also makes it feel very much like a... TV episode of the Tenth Doctor. It kind of an easy mark. Believe me, I know you and me and Anya. We've all lost people to the Daleks. So many dead, or hurt beyond endurance, or fallen out of this universe altogether. I do not understand. How did they fall? Oh, a long time ago now. Still, I'm sorry. And then we get the kind of RTD-esque vague note of like a doctor backstory when the 10th doctor says he left Gallifrey because of time because he outgrew it I'll tell you one thing the mystery isn't where you came from it's more why you left now that's the real killer why did you leave home doctor oh lots of reasons mostly it was just time people outgrow places you know yeah I hadn't even picked up that that was referring to like his original leaving of Gallifrey because there's so much sprinkled into this box set about of course, the Time War uh, is very heavy on the Doctor's mind, and there's all this stuff about Rose, and so I kind of lost track that that could actually be referring all the way back to uh, to the original. Also mentions uh, Astrid, because he references a, a Kylie Minogue album. Oh, <laughs> that's a thing. Oh. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I really, actually, the story, I wasn't really connecting with it much. Uh, for the f- like first two thirds anyway, like it was fine. I didn't feel it was outright bad or anything, but I, I, w- I wasn't really linked that in. Uh, but then I actually liked the twist. I thought that was a cool twist. I maybe I could have worked this out if I was paying more attention, but I wasn't, and so I had a pleasant surprise of oh, it's a whole loop, the whole thing. And I loved the concept of an androids being brought up by bears because of course the whole cycle with how how this all works is the android gets androids get memory wiped when they try to escape but then the bears in the woods like adopt them so then the android learns to roar like a bear and act like a bear and marek eight fine figure of a bear then when it gets captured back into the facility it breaks everything like a bear would and runs out i yeah i the bear thing is like so, so so random, but I liked how the Tenth Doctor kept having very endearing, cute names for the bears, and I, I think it's a cool concept of we build like human-like robots to imprint humanity onto, like they were designed to mimic humans. But that means if you put them in another context, interesting nature versus nurture thing, but with androids. Yeah, or for the more mainstream ones, like the way they say baby duck or baby chicken will imprint on the first thing it sees, that's its mother. Yeah. And it's 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 a good classic. I mean, you think the um the head guy is a human because he's like he's a bad boss. He's like acting all superior to the androids and everything. And so it's a cool. I mean, it's almost kind of heaven sent esque to have oh everyone is just running this exact same routine. Mm. Uh, but I guess unlike heaven sent, there's no like factor where it's gonna wear off. They they just keep going and going and going until Mark Seven is kind of the rogue element since he's more of a humany android and he's got. The Doctor and Anya there. The What I did find weird, though, was I feel like our TARDIS team were kind of unfair to Maria in a way. Like, I don't think her cause was that off base. Like, they, they were androids trapped in a pretty... Like, it's not a great situation. Like, I, I know Mark's a stickler for the rules, but I feel like her wanting to escape wasn't, like, the worst thing in the world. No. Yeah, definitely. And I thought it was interesting that... Um, not just this story, but obviously the next one as well, spent a lot of time talking about, you know, the ends justifying the means. How she wanted freedom so bad that she was willing to totally mess with and manipulate Mark Seven's life uh, in order to achieve that goal. And there's kind of that disapproval of that, but 
I think that juxtaposes really interestingly with how the Tenth Doctor refers back to the Time War. Because there's multiple times this box set where he talks about, oh, you know, millions of people uh, I had to sacrifice or whatever. Uh, I guess that, that really comes up more toward the, the final episode. But that, that was an interesting sort of contrast because that was an act of ends justifying the means. Like, your means weren't so great there either, but you're, you're quick to cast judgment. But that hypocrisy is part of what I see is very core to the Tenth Doctor's character. I'm not sure if that's uh, intentional, but they nailed that. Yeah, absolutely. And Ten is, he's dragging Mark and Anya through all these adventures. because He's manipulating them because he wants the freedom to go back to his time. And I can see where it works, yeah. I, it's, what, there's a point where Maria is like, she's all angry at the imbalance with how your androids are superior to humans and that they're faster and stronger, but they're always deferring to humans and so she's pretty skeptical of mark's friendships with anya and the doctor and the doctor walks in and rather than <laughs> saying anything useful or resolving that he just makes a quip about seesaws and then he moves on <laughs> <laughs> there will always be a power imbalance ah tricky thing power balances sit down too hard one end someone goes flying off into the air was that seesaws i thought the interesting thing with all those numbered androids was how we get that also all the original humans either died or they quit mm -hmm. and the androids were assigned to them to mimic them and to like study them to be good approximations of them and i mean this is being told by big finish so i totally i mean there's no recasts in this one <laughs> but i was totally reading into it. this is like you know how, how big finish have all these people that study past doctor who actors normally deceased ones to like mimic them as best they can did you guys think that it spent enough time characterizing mark seven that was kind of the focus of this story and obviously that had to be split with like the regular plot about the bears and the replacements and everything but do you think it was effective in making you more sympathetic to his character i feel like i think it focused on mark more than i feel the supposedly anya centrist centric story before this one focused on her for sure and like the flashbacks like that's fine and everything but it kind of felt more to me just like a you know this week's episode than like specifically like it's it, it didn't feel like you know what the girl who waited did for those companions or or things like that it felt like mostly a story of the week but with some mark characterization thrown in rather than like this makes me you know forever team mark now but i, I mean i like the moment where the doctor wants to kiss Mark and Mark says he'd prefer a hug. Like there were nice Mark moments <laughs> in this episode. I guess it's hard to characterize an Android and especially to not do it in a way where you're just like falling into doing Star Trek data episodes or just like doing C3PO type like beats. Like it's, it's a very well tread thing, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. I, I, I actually feel like the next story um, characterizes Mark better in some ways i feel like that pushed him more i agree yeah, yeah even though it's not it's not like a mark episode but it got me more interested in mark than than this one did oh mark you hunky robot genius i could kiss you that is pleasing if unnecessary let's settle for a hug then eh? Oh, that is acceptable i guess ultimately with a cycle of destruction to me, it felt very coherently part of the series. It felt like a logical next step after the first three episodes. The play on home worlds and the past and how one defines themselves, it all felt very much linked into the series. I found the bear stuff cute. I appreciated getting some more characterization for Mark Seven, and the way the plot ended up going, I thought that held together and was fairly interesting. But pretty serviceable David Tennant episode it doesn't really light a fire under me and given how this series has been promoted as a veritable series of david Tennant doctor who i do what i kind of did with similar supposed companion focused episode the house of kingdom and i think of the companion focus episodes and the companions in general we got on doctor who itself and it just kind of emphasizes to me that while i do think anya and mark are actual characters i don't think they're just bland mouth pieces for exposition or anything the way some other companions are I think they are characters here, but I still feel they fall so very short of Donna, Rose, Martha. And with this big canvas of nine episodes, and 
all the talk of the freedom that that has offered the writers, I feel more inclined to, to a degree, kind of hold them to those higher standards. I'm not saying I expect something on the level of what Russell T Davies did with Donna Noble or anything, but I'm saying I do kind of expect more than this. Some flashbacks of Mark having his effective family get killed by Daleks, yeah, it's the bones of drama, but it's a far cry from what, you know, the other <laughs> David Tennant series did. And I found the themes of this story kind of odd and wishy-washy. If you're going to raise themes of self-determination, identity construction, the role of family determinism, all that kind of stuff, I'd hope for something more coherent than this kind of unquestioned skepticism of an android wanting liberation. It invokes those big sci-fi themes, but to me it seemed kind of loath to really engage with them uh, with that much meaning. It's not like an hour is some impossible amount of time to do so, there's other audios that have done so. Maybe getting a bit more Blade Runner with it would have been interesting. In any case, it wasn't an exercise in nostalgia the way I found episode 3 of the series, so it did feel like an improvement to me. On the note of Mark 7 focus stories, before we get to John Dorney's fifth episode, the kind of midpoint of the series, over the halfway point I suppose since it's a nine episode series, before we talk about that, the Trojan Dalek, I'd like to take a little look at another Mark 7 story, The Destroyers. Terry Nation's unproduced pilot script for an American Dalek spin-off that was meant to have been made in the 1960s. What drew my attention to The Destroyers in terms of discussing this box set Dalek Universe 2? Well, something curious I noticed about this whole Dalek Universe series, with how it's being released over three box sets, is that the first and the third box set kind of have a corresponding story to them from a different audio release. For Dalek Universe 1, it was that Tom Baker story, The Dalek Protocol, which was promoted as a prequel to the series, and in our Dalek Universe 1 discussion we talked about that. It's certainly not something you have any need to listen to in engaging with Dalek Universe, but it exists, and it was promoted as linked with Dalek Universe. And the third Dalek Universe box set, well, it features River Song, and River actually had an adventure with Dalek Universe companions Anya Kingdom and Mark Seven in our 2021 box set in a story called Queen of the Mechanoids. And we'll discuss that story in our Dalek Universe 3 discussion too, because of that River Song linkage. So for the sake of, if nothing else, tidiness, I was curious if there was any other story that linked into Dalek Universe 2. And there's not really, there's nothing exactly contemporary, but there is another story that is somewhat relevant to Dalek Universe, and it has Mark 7 in it. And Dalek Universe 2 is the set that focuses the most on Mark 7, so I figured now, if ever, is the time to discuss it. It's called The Destroyers. The story behind it is, well the rundown is that, Dalek Universe, as discussed in our first discussion, riffs heavily off the writings of Terry Nation, a famous Doctor Who writer who originated the Daleks and loads of other time-honoured Doctor Who things. Daleks were incredibly enormously popular in the 1960s, it was Dalek mania. And as the writer of the Daleks, Terry Nation held the rights to the character of the Daleks. And Terry Nation was so confident when it came to the popularity of the Daleks that he kind of wrote them out of Doctor Who with a mind to go make a series in America about them. This Dalek spin-off would not feature the Doctor, it would be about the Daleks, and the space security service that we of course see, well we hear, in Dalek Universe. The pilot script for this Dalek spin-off was called The Destroyers. Terry Nation's budget breakdown for it was less than the Star Trek 1960s pilot, but a hell of a lot more than a 1960s Doctor Who episode. But still, as a co-production between the American network ABC and the BBC themselves, the pilot of this Dalek spin-off, not necessarily the whole series itself, but certainly this Destroyer's pilot, got pretty close to being produced, but as often happens with these sorts of things, it eventually all fell apart and it was never made. Many, many decades later, in December 2010, Big Finish released an audio adaptation of this pilot script, The Destroyer's. Nicholas Briggs and John Dorney adapted it for audio, which apparently didn't require much substantial 
reworking apart from the cliffhanger ending? It, it's basically the same thing. The only scene, uh, as I was saying to people earlier, was um, that, that's, that's kind of completely different is the very, very last scene of the script because the very last scene in, in the original teleplay, it was it was a visual metaphor and, and you can't actually do that hmm. on audio. It was, it was a sort of a, 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 the earth floating in space and, a, and the image of a Dalek growing larger and larger and, and, and covering it. So I was trying to find in the final scene a way of doing that um, with words. What are the connections to Dalek Universe? Well, Mark Seven is in it, along with Anya Kingdom's aunt Sarah, who was of course from TV, Doctor Who itself, the big The Daleks master plan serial that Dalek Universe riffs a lot off. Mark Seven is played by a different actor than he is in Dalek Universe, but the character is the same sort of archetype, a perfect android, very logical, but quite human, quite human in some ways. It was it was very interesting how he was described in this story. Mark is handsome in the most classical sense. His features and physique are perfect. One in the mould of Adonis, Dorian Gray and the Greek gods, a sculptor asked to produce the ideal male, would design Mark Seven. Yeah. Anyway, I find Joe Sims' performance as Mark Seven in Dalek Universe more engaging, more layered. But he does have a lot more room to play around, he gets a lot more stories, and the writing for him was done in the 2020s, not in the mid-1960s in a script reworked from failed pilot to a kind of hybrid audio drama thing. And I say hybrid uh, because large parts of the story are narrated by the actress for Sarah Kingdom, Jean Marsh. In Terry Nation's script for TV, Sarah Kingdom had a much smaller part in the story, but Big Finish swapped her role with another character here. I'm assuming so they could make good use of Jean Marsh, a well-loved Doctor Who actor who does do a good job with the narration. She brings a nice atmospheric character to it. I guess I'm burying the lead here. How was the actual story itself? Um, I can see why it wasn't commissioned to become a TV show. Maybe others had a different experience of it than me, and I'd love to hear from them if so. Uh, but to my ears, it came across as an hour of thinly sketched characters walking around a planet with some hostile plants, the Daleks occasionally showing up and barking some evil things, and then ending on a forever unresolved cliffhanger. It continues its usual cycle, its usual orbit, unchanging, unharmed, safe. The same as always. Unaware of one thing, one simple, deadly thing. The Daleks are coming. I feel like it's just the cold open to an actual premiere that never happened. Some of the issues are that you can tell the script must have been pretty visual, so there's a lot of narration and action which doesn't always come across great on audio. But even if it had been made for TV, it's so devoid of growth or development or characterization that beyond just the base appeal of seeing, hearing, experiencing the Daleks do anything, I'm not sure how much would have really been there. One of the actors for the audio adaptation brought up that Maybe it was Terry Nation riffing off the Vietnam War, in a way. I have a theory that um, this is, uh, you know, to cater to the American market, this is actually the Daleks in Vietnam. <laughs> oh. <laughs> With these oh, yeah. jungle creatures and... Uh, well, yes, yes. And, and, and the idea of some sort of fantasy uh, jungle world that is hostile. Uh, I, I, I can imagine that would be playing into the sort of visual imagination mm. of the time. But even if that was the case, I think you're hard-pressed to find political commentary of any stripe here. I did like the music. Some cool 1960s stuff. A cool guitar part too. Let's move. And so carrying only their guns, they move off swiftly into the darkness. They trudge for miles. The relationship between Doctor Who and this never produced Dalek spin-off is a little unclear to me in that Sarah Kingdom is a character in it. Her character was boosted for this audio adaptation, but she's still a character in Terry Nation's 1962 script for it. But as discussed in this Dalek Universe 2 box set between Anya and the Doctor, Sarah Kingdom 
perished in the Daleks master plan story that, you know, so much of this stuff is riffing off. So perhaps it was just going to be an inconsistency between the two shows and it wasn't meant to have actually matched up or perhaps they would have developed something there. But I see why it wasn't developed further as an actual TV show in the 60s. It's interesting to compare that to what we've got here today, an actual series on audio, not TV, but still it's a series based on all these Terry Nation ideas. It's got Dalek in the title, Mark Seven as a lead character, the space security service, all that jazz. And an animated visual Dalek-centric spin-off was made as part of the Time Lord Victorious project in 2020, again based on a lot of Terry Nation concepts and this idea of a Dalek-centric spin-off without the Doctor. And Big Finish had done a Dalek-based spin-off without the Doctor called Dalek Empire in the 2000s as well. Clearly, there's something about Terry Nation that really speaks to certainly these writers at Big Finish. But enough of this alternate Mark 7 from a 1960s script. What of the Mark 7 of 2021? How does the next story go? The Trojan Dalek, of which Mark is a major part. Uh, first off, I found this name hilarious, and I know this isn't what the concept actually ends up being, but like the concept of a Trojan Dalek, like a, a Trojan horse Dalek, just feels like so self-evidently absurd to me because <laughs> Dalek is so obviously evil looking. Of course, the story, it's not doing that kind of dumb take on it in the end, but that title had me very amused uh, before the box it actually released. Uh, but what do we think of the actual story as it turned out? I liked it. I liked the conflict between Mark and Anya. I thought that was a really interesting note to start it off with, with that kind of introduction of the romance, the sort of love interest. Uh, hasty introduction, but still, it was uh, definitely a different direction to take. And I think that kind of shows how they're doing more interesting things with the companion dynamic. Ooh, I think someone has a crush on you. Anya. What? Felicity is a decent human. She's not a fit subject for mockery. Uh, I'm sorry? You would do well to hold your tongue. Oh, you know, Mark, if I didn't know better, I'd swear you were angry. Really? How strange. Let's leave it on you. No, no, if I said something wrong. Because like you said, there's that distrust with Anya, even though, um, you know, they talk in the commentary about how she's intended to be a much more modern style character, but they, uh, yeah, the distrust was, was a really interesting aspect and that kind of shines through in the conflict and that disagreement between them. Like, yeah, I feel like in general, the characters, all of them just had more going on here than in other stories in this set. Like, I was I was more cool on the um, opening Dawny two-parter and the first box set than I think the other guys here. But, like, Dawny clearly, he's, he often knows what he's doing. Like, in this one, the characters just immediately all feel a bit deeper to me, a bit realer. This feels more like an actual... TARDIS team to me not only the way they like banter together but the way they needle each other it just felt mm -hmm. it all felt a lot more real and I got a lot more connected into this episode because it, yeah all the all the drama and the interactions felt a lot more solid to me yeah they felt more characters rather than plot points yeah exactly it's four minutes in and we're just you know getting the stuff about the e-word I would have thought you would have been pleased it was easy oh no have I said something wrong? The E word. You used the E word. Don't be harsh on him, Doctor. He's not been doing this long. I don't understand. What's the matter with saying our task will be easy? Don't say it again. Don't keep saying it. If you insist, I shall refrain from using what you refer to as the E word in future. I don't wish to offend. Shall we get on with it? And they, they feel more like old <laughs> companions, you know, like they have, they have these time-worn little conflicts and banters and stuff. It all, it, all, it all just works well. What did you guys think of the big Dalek, like, fake out? You know, they had the Daleks on the cover of this story, and there's been such a uh, deliberate kind of dramatic <laughs> absence of the Daleks so far for a series called Dalek Universe. Uh, so I was I was kind of excited to get the big appearance of the Daleks. I guess they're saving that for the big, big finale um, because this was this was an interesting fake out. Yeah, I feel like I hear so much Dalek stuff in general just because Big Finish do so, so many Dalek stories that I'm amused by this kind of irony of 
the self-titled Dalek universe, like two two thirds in, still kind of lacking, you know, a big Dalek story. So I, I was pleased that it wasn't actually a Dalek story in the way I assume the last two episodes are gonna be. Uh, yeah, I, I I thought it was good. I didn't expect the title to be switched around to mean fake Daleks being Trojan Daleks. When the Daleks started talking and it wasn't Nick Briggs's voice, I was thrown off and wondering, you know, what is going on, what is happening. I think I think that was a cool moment. Just for a split second, I didn't even recognise it as a Dalek, which was weird. To, like, I just thought it was like a security robot thing. And then, like, looking at the cover more closely, I realised, yeah, these Daleks look a bit weird. They look they look banged yeah. up and kind of malformed. So I think it's a... I know he, he loves misdirection a lot, uh, John Dorney, the writer, because that's what the opening two-parter with the monk is as well. It's, you know, misdirection mm-hmm. about the regeneration. So he got me here, and I, and I was happy to be got. He got me too. I just assumed it's going to be the typical storyline, a Dalek pretending to be good, and then it turns. And that, that I went in just expecting that, and I... So that, that'll do. I'll be happy with that. But I was very, very surprised and very pleased with what they actually did. It got properly dark, too. Like, this wasn't just, like, a fun... A CNA level dark. Yeah, it was It was, it was really uh, messed up. Yeah, I, I, I was very surprised how how much they went into it. It's always good to have Tennant just being able to act fully indignant and outraged against someone who just is obviously evil. <laughs> it's it's he, the face, you know, the face you used to get when he like screams out Donna and his like yeah. mouth is just like so <laughs> concentrated and open yeah. like I I just this it bursts into my mind in stories like these where he's outraged and indignant and yelling around. And it's it, it's clear Tennant is having fun doing it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's probably the most weighty stuff I've heard Tennant do so far for Big Finish. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I also this I mean this isn't the dark stuff, but I liked I think Dawny's pretty good at doing Ten's kind of witticisms or attempts at them. Like what always the greatest hits with Daleks, isn't it? Never anything from your experimental f- phase. All these kinds of little lines <laughs> he says. They just feel very Tenth Doctor. Some other Tenth Doctor audios sometimes feel a little bit tepid. Like he's t- tenants being tenanty, but the lions themselves aren't kind of feeding to him as much. But I, f- I felt in this one he was getting, you know, more of the range of what he got on TV. There was one that I was surprised to hear actually articulated. And I'm not sure how I feel about it because it kind of f- felt clunky. But um, it's the line, it's like, You don't stop the Daleks by becoming them, Major. My people learn that to their cost. But at least with them, it was just a metaphor. <laughs> that's, that's a, yeah, it's a, <laughs> <laughs> a bit belabouring the point, yeah. Like, I'm already thinking about the parallels between the Time Lords and the Daleks, and, you know, I'm glad that John it wasn't lost on John Dorney. Like, it was, you know, I'm glad he made use of that kind of obvious parallel. But at the same time, yeah, that was just a bit kind of spelling out. <laughs> In Doctor Who, at least the Tenth Doctor audios, I feel like a general there's a general reticence to really hold to not explain things. I find in general, like I, f- mm. some audios do it, but I feel in general, jokes tend to get spelled out and endings tend to get explained, uh, and it's not always bad. But I feel like they never are comfortable with letting something slip by a listener potentially, mm. which is sometimes. Mm-hmm. A sh- I mean, we get that Paul Sanders or whatever her name is like the literal comparison i'm the last of my kind you know and then it's like oh they're they're from you know that's like the 10th doctor it's like we could have gotten that without you know speaking directly to it but it it is what it is but i, mean, I suppose at the same time the, the 10th doctor range is most likely big finishes biggest entry level range that's yeah. what's going to get a lot of new listeners people new to the audio experience as well that's the weirdness of this series i guess of you know all the all the Terry Nation stuff. <laughs> I do love how this series is so. It's just so completely in tune with the Tenth Doctor's headspace. It's just yeah. every, you know, the last of the Time Lord thing, all his losses. They're just, you know, present in every scene, and you can just feel it. So yeah, I think it's a bit redundant to actually have to point it out. Like it's just so obvious. Like it's so implicit that these parallels are there. I liked, yeah, it's the Blue Peter line, calling the Daleks the Blue Peter version. That felt so, I could so see him saying that. 
you yeah. know, in 2007 on yeah. TV. Mm-hmm. It was such a true Tenth Doctor line. What are they? They're not Daleks. Oh, uh, was it that obvious? A bit, yeah. I've got a lot of experience with the real thing, you see. Far too much, if I'm honest. But it does mean that I can spot when it's the Blue Peter version. What are they made of? Fizzy pop bottles and sticky back plastic? Salvaged remains, mainly. Spoils of war. Very good, yes. The, the stuff with the Arbrick Dalek, yeah, that was proper body horror. Lovely to get on audio. That was really sad. And it's like, it's saying exterminate me, but it's not like just a complete riff on Robert Schumann's Dalek episode where the Dalek is all, you know, suicidal. It's It kind of builds up to it more. It's in a lot of pain. It wants Ten to stop the pain. It doesn't necessarily just want to die at first. He, I should say. Yeah, it feels like... You know when people talk about Big Finish in the past, how amazing and dark it was, it feels like it was at least trying to do that again. Yeah. Mm. It's, well, this story and the next story, I feel like we're kind of hearkening to Big Finish's, well, what a lot of fans see is their heyday in that way. Yeah, it's it's getting darker or it's getting weirder or character-focused. It's pretty cool in that way. This is like the promise for me, you know, years before we even Tennant was doing Big Finish, like, one day he might be able to do things like this on audio. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's nice to actually get, you know, hints of that. And I think it fits perfectly in Ten's timeline where it is. I think it worked. I don't think it would have worked as well maybe earlier in his timeline, but in the space between uh, Journey's End and the End of Time, it's a perfect point for all these dark stories for him. Yeah, especially especially because um, is it is it Journey's End or the Next Doctor? Uh, where the tenth doctor has that line about companions, oh, they break my heart, and then you know next doctor, yeah, yeah, and marked and like this Mark is the, breaks this his heart. Be set, in this one, this would be set between you know, uh, between the next doctor and Planet of the Dead. So yeah, yeah, before he finds out there's a you no, know, someone's gonna be someone's gonna knock four times, you know. Yeah, but straight after he's in that place where he's just more than usual thinking about all the people he's lost yeah it's a, it's a very ripe time um it's interesting well with davros in journey's end um you know listing all the people he's well not listing them but talking about all the people he's lost and then you get the montage that kind of ties in with this box set as well yeah i mean this is more for the third episode the lost but yeah and it's interesting that we're going to see davros again like i think that i i really liked how the how that Arborek reveal really subverted my expectations for how that whole thing was going to go. He's been who they've been... uh, He's who they've been looking for for the last three uh, stories, pretty much since the start, I think. Yeah. They were looking all over for Arborek. And uh, having him turn into the Dalek, that that really really shocked me. That that spooked me. Um, And it was a good fake out at the same time i kind of wish that we would see the daleks because this is definitely uh this was the second story in dalek universe so far where we've seen the humans just completely desperate doing completely unethical things so that they have some kind of weapon against the dalek menace that is hanging over their every thought and action and yet we haven't actually seen the dalek menace I, I don't think there were even, you know, we've had flashbacks, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, I know we're getting the big sort of event story, the big two-parter, but it would be nice, I know what you mean, to get a real ground-level st- Dalek story. This is what they're doing to this community or this planet, just to see this is how bad it is. I feel like we're going to have a Dalek hangover after the Matt Fitton two-parter finale. In yeah. The third <laughs> set. I feel, be careful what you're wishing for here. But yeah, I, I, get okay. I think if we pretend this is, you know, what it's kind of meant to be maybe in like if we pretend this is a series 4.5 in 2009 or whatever and it's coming soon after the Stolen Earth Journey's End, it makes more sense to me like working off the shorthand of the Daleks just did all this crazy stuff, you know. He's back in time. The Daleks are still so bad. It's We're still in kind of um, Dalek mania light from the 2000s. But I know what you mean, that, like, if we're looking at this story, this series as its own thing in a vacuum, which is a weird idea for so many reasons. But in that sense, yeah, the stakes haven't really been set up in a, in a, in a clear way in that sense. Yeah, that's fair. 
That's fair. I guess in the Tenant Seasons, there's so much, like, Dalek. It, they really are still a finale villain. We haven't yeah. had Into the Dalek yet. We haven't had the kind of trivialization in, uh, I don't know, that... Uh, Wedding of River Song. Yeah, yeah, exactly, right? That sort of thing. Um, so this is very much more in vain with the RTD. That's a great point. So I didn't even considered that like he's just had a massive dealing with the Daleks and you know he's just met Davos again at, and now he's going to meet him again again so yeah I'm curious funny. if he'll like vague post about oh Davros in a few decades <laughs> who knows what's going to happen when he meets classic Davros in the, in the next set I like at the uh, same time it's kind of hard to place in Ten's timeline because he talks so much about Rose I feel we've had at least a few mentions about Rose. Obviously, he throws in Donna as well. But after Parting of the Ways, or no, not Parting of the Ways, sorry. After, um, crap, the Series 4 finale. Uh, Journey's End. You would think that that's kind of resolved emotionally. I don't know. Well, yeah, it's interesting because he did just see Rose, but he supposedly, she got the, you know, the, the, the Doctor without a tie. She got the Crisis Doctor. So, but I think, I think... It's one of those things where characters finish their plot lines and then, you know, a decade goes by. And then we remember, not necessarily the characters flanderized, but we remember the most memorable bits of the character, even if they're bits that their development, you know, went past. It's like when we got Tenet back in the 50th, I think he was kind of in the mode of, I know I loved how he was written, but I think he's kind of in this mode of how we remember the Doctor, you know, is mm-hmm. maybe more romantic and dashing and, you know, in the mode of romance than he actually was in the actual episodes of the RTD era, but it's the things that stick with us through time. So I think there's this kind of inherently revisionist element when you bring back characters like more than a decade after they left where no matter where you put them in the timeline, we're functioning off the stuff we remember the most. And I think everyone remembers the Doctor whining about Rose a lot, (laughs) even though maybe he shouldn't be doing it so much after Journey's End, yeah. I loved the classic 10 gurning moment of then it's a terrible plan when he's yelling at the colonel guy with the whole moral crux of you know the daleks would see through robots or human pilots so we've got to do this inhumane (laughs) mutation it's the only way and then 10 gets the interesting thing of imagining mutant well i guess all daleks are mutant but this type of dalek being used to go go after miners on strike on earth colonies and things like that i i liked how we immediately brought it to that kind of thing yeah and miners on strike felt like a very kind of like um specific british very kind pointed of way yeah. To frame it yeah yeah like i yeah. Made, i mean not much experience with dawny episodes but i wasn't expecting something so politically pointed yeah. like that <laughs> yeah but yeah it's it cool and the colonel had such the kind of um, after the fact ways to try and redeem what he was doing. Like, well, they were soldiers and this is kind of letting them continue to serve. They'd probably want this, you know, if, if they would have consented to it. Uh, he had that very slimy way of trying to come up with reasons why this was actually totally cool, what they were doing. Mm. But as 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 the Tenth Doctor says, the, you don't stop the Daleks by becoming them in that long metaphor. <laughs> mm-hmm. And then I guess it was a very typical New Who thing where uh, he wanted to get to the conversion spot so he could just wave his Sonic around and, like, fix things. <laughs> yeah, there were a few. Um, I don't think any of these actually had, like, a real satisfying ending. Even with uh, even with the, the cycle of destruction, I know we already stopped talking about that, but with the way that... Mark 7, I mean, they talk so much about how these these are the androids, they're programmed to do what they're programmed to do, you know, it was kind of undermining their agency, uh, at least in the conversation with the, the humans or the people who thought they were humans. But uh, then for Mark 7 to defy the programming, and like, that's kind of the conclusion of the story, is that he just, he just overrides what Mariah had programmed in him. Um, and then in this story... Where, yeah, Sonic Screwdriver kind of saves the day. Obviously, there's much more to the story than that. I feel, for me, the classic New Who-esque Doctor waves the Sonic around like a magic wand, the plot is solved thing. That actually works better for me in audio because on screen, I see the Doctor is just kind of spinning around, 
you know, doing that spinny move they do <laughs> and he's waving the song. And it's just kind of self-evidently ridiculous. But on audio, I don't know about you guys, but I find action scenes on audio kind of inherently a little bit incoherent or a bit chaotic. And so mm. just to have like the doctor yelling and the sonic whirring and dark saying, just like it's, <laughs> it's kind of a, just a general sense of chaos that feels less silly to me and more like intense than when I'm on screen and I'm actually watching the doctor twirl around. You know, just pointing it like a magic wand at people. This, that's probably not high praise, but it's it's why the sonic stuff tends to work a little bit better for me without my eyes. Yeah, there's, there's been some audios, not in this box set, but where you've just you're given a wall of sound and you're trying yeah. to piece piece it together. The sonic, even though it's a handy solution, it works, and it, you know what the sound means, and you know what's going to happen. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't put this on the sound guys. I think they do a good job. Like I think the things sit well in the mix. It's just kind of if you've scripted something where it's like an action scene, loud music, sonic going, Daleks yelling, explosions. Like if you've scripted that for an audio, there's only so much the sound person can do. They can put all those elements in and they can mix them well and sit differently in the mix. But it's still going to be just lots of noise that's kind of hard to discern coming at you. Yeah, I just noticed that in uh, The Destroyers, which I listened to the other day, kind of, you know, as, as thinking back to what that could have been with Mark Sarah, with Mark uh, Seven and Sarah Kingdom. And there's whole scenes where Sarah Kingdom is like struggling to escape, you know, an ooze pit or something. And, you know, they just narrate it. They just brought in the narrator for that whole ser- uh, that whole serial because I think they knew that it wouldn't have made any sense in audio. And yeah. Uh, I, I didn't feel that confusion at all in Dalek Universe. So that's a huge credit to uh, to the sound guys and also the script writers. Yeah. The Mark overriding his programming kind of stuff. I'm not against any of that. I I like this. I, I'm totally cool with like Cybermen stories where like the power of love saves the day because like yeah. Cybermen, it's literally a human that's been turned into a robot, but there's still human stuff in there. So the idea that vestigial human things can override the robot that makes total sense to me i get that it can feel cheap for people but i've i've no problem with that story but it makes total sense to me but something that's been built as a robot overcoming like its program like i have no problem with it like i'm, I'm not like well realistically a uh, 40th century android wouldn't do this like that's, <laughs> that, that's crazy but i i just i just find it a little more i find it a little more abstract as a beat just because it's just like total flying on faith Oh, I don't understand how androids work. But this android worked differently than, you know, how androids normally work. Cool. Like, I'm totally fine with it, but it's just a little bit less interesting to me because it's not like I had any grounding in what androids could do previously. Mm. Yeah, I feel like it's a struggle because I know we already mentioned data and I I really feel like data from the next generation is kind of the the gold standard android story. Yeah. And so yeah. after, in the wake of that, it's a little hard to do an Android story that isn't just, oh, this is like data. And I think they did a really good job of that with Mark 7. You know, he has the emotions. He's not, uh, he's not a total C-3PO style uh, emotionless character. So I, I could buy it because he definitely feels more human in, you know, in, in that kind of Cyberman context you mentioned. He feels superhuman. Yeah. And then he died. That was the other thing that happened in this story, right? <laughs> yeah. It, it didn't actually... It made very little impact on me because I'm just like, well, he died. Sure. This is Doctor Who. This is audio Doctor Who. He'll be back. He'll be in the next one. And then before <laughs> I listened to the next one, I just kind of thought, I should, like, wait. And I had an impulse to go check the cover of the third box set. And then my eyes bulged because the actor's name is not on the third box set. Joe yeah. name is not... And so I went, and then like retroactively, I was like, "Oh shit!" That the ending of the Trojan Dalek was actually a a big ending. I assumed it would just be an undone death, like Doctor Who always does. But what the hell? He's not in the next box set. And so then I immediately went and listened to the next episode. But so I I feel it's not really the fault of this story in itself, but just like death in general of Doctor Who. I mean, I don't roll my eyes at it, but I I don't. Into, I don't immediately buy into it just because it's it's Doctor Who. Like it, it's probably not going to stick. Yeah, it's it's comic book logic. Like you're, yeah, you're not going to expect someone to die forever, and especially with audio. 
he could come back anytime in the past or yeah yeah or even yeah. with a time travel show in general anything can happen and I was expecting the next story I was fully expecting him at the end to come back somehow yeah. just because well, of the premise of the story and how things like this usually work I guess this is why the next story is like so much about excavating Mark's death and like really going into how the Doctor and Anya feel about it because it's it's like something the listener is going to kind of potentially bounce off, and so we need a whole story to kind of go through. Oh wow, that was that was that was for real. But yeah, and it's and because Mark and Joe Sims, the actor, was so much advertised in all the Dark Universe stuff, I just I never even thought to actually you know cross reference the covers of the box sets. But around halfway through the series, to lose one of the two companions, that's wild. It's very gutsy. It's you know something the show I wouldn't see doing so much. Yeah, that story definitely felt like the finale of the box set to me. And then The Lost was more of like a, a coda, sort of. Like, oh, this was the mid-season finale. We're at the halfway point through the season. This crazy stuff happened. We're going to have a break until the next box set comes out. But first, let's let's uh, let's do, you know, some introspection. Which I appreciate, because it would have been very easy to... Especially if it was left for a finale, it would have been very easy to uh, not dwell on the impact of this on the Doctor and also Anya. So it was nice that they then took the time to really follow up on it. On on the note we were saying earlier of kind of over-explaining things, uh, I'm sure this moment worked for a lot of people. And like, I'm envious if this moment worked for you. <laughs> but when the Fliss Dalek is like, Mark, Mark, I love you. And then that's like the the whole death <laughs> thing. I that was is just too strained for me, too on the nose. Uh, that pulled me out a little bit. I don't, I don't know if that emotionally resounded better for you guys. Mark. Mark. I love you. I get that it's hard to. Uh, show that kind of internal struggle in a person as like their worst nature is taking over kind of Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde style. Oh my gosh, I'm turning into a Dalek. Uh, I think it wasn't helped that uh, That the voice modulation was going the entire time. Yeah, like, that's something where they could have done something with a voice effect to add more differentiation, but yeah, I was super confused like after she said that or she said some other thing that was like, I'm not a Dalek. And then and then later it was, it was I am a Dalek. But then it was, it was like, where, where are we standing with this character? And then we just heard her <laughs> exterminating stuff. And I was like, oh my gosh, I don't really understand what's going on. It's, it's tricky because I'm fine with like the shorthand of, oh, this is the old flame of a character. Like that works fine to set up out of nowhere. But when there's all this stuff hinging on Fliss... And she, she's not like, we never hear referenced, oh, Mark Seven had an old girlfriend or whatever, like in earlier stories. It's it's just kind of hard to be doing all these moves and shifts with her when, like, I, I don't really know who this person is. This is just like a character kind of being used to characterize Mark. So, yeah, some some of, I, well, I guess it's the trade-off. You can, the ending will be more confusing if you don't have characters saying, Mark, Mark, I love you, like straight up. So, yeah, it is what it is. Yeah, it's interesting. They could have mentioned her in the Mark 7 backstory characterization episode, but then it would have felt really weird when she, like, just happened to show up. Um, yeah, that's true. I'm not really sure how they could have done that better, but I definitely I feel like they could have taken some of the time they spent making jokes about the 1970s and, uh, and used that, so I don't know. Especially because Dawny says in the behind the scenes that they plotted this all out beforehand. So it's not like a case of, oh, we only came up with Fliss, like he said. I'd initially worked out a sort of general arc plan some time ago for the Dalek Universe storyline across the whole nine discs and uh, plots and twists and turns all the way across. This lot was originally going to be done by a different writer, but they had to drop out for various reasons and uh, because it was quite a key arc story and I was very familiar with the plot lines everyone else was uh, having and developing it made sense that I worked on a replacement script my final thoughts on the Trojan Dalek would be 
I like Tennant's performance in this. I love his fieriness. And I think John Dorney does the best work of the series yet in terms of making the Doctor, Anya and Mark feel like a real TARDIS team. Feel like there's a lived in history to them, making them feel like sketched in characters with their own personalities and ways of relating to each other. And also highlighting the ways Anya and Mark Seven differ from those TV tenant companions that I felt drawn to contrast them with when thinking of the last episode. Some of the dialogue here felt over explainy in an awkward way to me, but some of the dialogue also kind of sang and felt more lively and lived in than I'd really felt in previous episodes here. I loved how the Trojan Dalek story developed in terms of how surprisingly dark it got, mostly in terms of what was done with the Daleks here, since for the reasons we discussed, I wasn't actually particularly struck by Mark's death at first. The body horror in this story was indeed horrifying, and I think that worked well for audio, since it had our brains visualising something awful. The audio experience was very unpleasantly and effectively evocative in that way. I liked that while the plot to a degree had an easy resolution with the sonic screwdriver stuff, there wasn't an easy resolution to the plight of the transformed Daleks themselves. The story was dark and held to that. The story also continued the big surprise of the whole series to me, a very welcome one. It's not overstuffed with Daleks, actual Daleks anyway. Instead the Daleks are a kind of amusingly small presence in it, leaving more room for other things. Which works well for me, since not only does Big Finish, but all Doctor Who in general tend to use the regular Daleks so 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 much. In fighting the Daleks, you have become a Dalek, you have become like a Dalek. That kind of thing certainly isn't an original idea, but the darkly literal way it was realised here, I thought that was effective. I liked how the body horror aspect and the Doctor's indignation conveyed the darkness of it. Of course, at least in this stage of his life, the Doctor would probably rage and snarl at any combative method humans came up with for fighting Daleks, but I feel like the singular inhumanity of this method helped sidle it away from being a kind of Doctor centrism, particularly as the Doctor does specifically get disgusted at this body horror making humans Dalek method, having been funded over the combat venom method explored in episode 3, The House of Kingdom. And the self-evident depravity in the military figures' justifications for the torturous project, I felt they emphasised this wasn't some good faith necessary way to fight the Daleks, it was a sadistic method that, as the Doctor pointed out, would inevitably be used to enact violence and subjugation on human workers as well. Obviously the Doctor's occasional lofty pacifism and sometimes centrism is no solution to a very real <laughs> to a very formidable threat like the Daleks, and the TV show does criticise that sometimes, but I think this story did a good job showing some methods of violent resistance are just so inhumane and so primed to be used back on human workers as well, that the Doctor is pretty justified in condemning them. I like the idea of Mark Seven having a kind of would-be old flame, that's an interesting note for him. And I think Dorney did a good job pulling some tense strings on that with Mark and Anya's relationship, but Mark and the old flame, of course, turned into a Dalek. Their relationship was done in such broad strokes that it didn't play very well to me, and I found the final melodrama of it unintentionally comic, though I think Mark Seven's actor did do good work throughout the whole episode. The robot is a real boy emotions type development for him, well it was set up and everything, I don't have any issue with the idea. But again, the broad strokes way it was done here kind of muted the effect for me. Along with my, I think, justified scepticism towards real major character death in Doctor Who stories. And the general chaos of how action like this was realised in the audio format here exacerbated some of that muted effect for me. Basically, in terms of the Mark stuff, I'm on board for the ideas here, but the execution didn't capture me. Actually, no, while I was on board for Mark having a kind of would-be old flame, I don't think there was really, I don't think there's any way to execute just killing them off to motivate Mark stuff. I don't think there's any way of doing that that I'd really find interesting or worthwhile, really. I think that was a very tired choice. Because when the premise of a story is already something Doctor Who has done so much on that Dalek note, it feels a bit much to pepper in a fridging like that as well. So yeah, there was a lot that worked for me here and a lot that didn't, and overall, I was more engaged with this than, than any previous episode of the series. I enjoyed it, listening to it definitely made me look forward to discussing the set with you guys. And next came the big one, the most critically acclaimed story of the series so far, The Lost. Now this has the best cover 
like the cover image I've seen Big Finish do for years. I've I haven't like outright enjoyed just like the aesthetics of a Big Finish cover like this for a long time. I think this mm. looks great. I get that there's a co- the all the cover artists for Big Finish do a good job, but I think what they're called to do these days is very much a kind of sales driven thing where like you need to have all these faces on the covers because you know all these faces are what attracts attention yeah that. it's a very marvel star wars sort of thing it didn't used to their early stuff had all kinds of interesting covers that you know, might not have really sold this actor is in it or it's going to have this element you remember from the show but it kind of communicated something about the vibe of the story a lot of the early big finishes had that uh not so much these days but this even though it's got two faces it's it looks really cool. It has a nice color scheme. It's just it's just really interestingly set up. I really like this cover. Yeah, it gives off like introspective vibes, I think. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It felt like something I would want in I looked at it and I thought of, oh, I would use this setting in a D&D campaign. Like that portal, the kind of mystic looking dude standing in front of it. Um and that very much matched the vibe of the story too with the uh I forget what they called it, the the aesthetically crumbling buildings and all that um so it definitely set the tone very effectively more effectively i think than the montage of faces tends to do because that could happen anywhere i think part of this is it's a kind of a structural thing it's why i think the tortured audios tend to have better covers it's not something like all oh, the different people are doing them because it's tends to be like the same six guys the big finished use it's that tortured audios it's usually like two actors or three actors you can't put seven faces you know art on the cover because there aren't that many people in it you know in this story it's pretty much just david tennant and jane slavin so it's two faces and it's so much easier to do i think something interesting with the cover the less you need to put in there yeah it's sort of it reminds me like if they were to do the eighth doctor story uh, skirts out there to make that cover now that's a two-hander story but just a doctor and companion and i think that this reminds me of if they were to make it today that's the sort of cover they'd make. Yeah. Two faces and just something happening, but nothing too extravagant. Yeah, totally. Uh, so I think we all got off on a good foot <laughs> then just from the cover <laughs> of, of the story. What did we think of the actual hour we spent with it? I think it lived up to my expectations because obviously going in, it always seemed poised to be the one that's going to be the, the the really interesting one the really... And, you know, I liked um, The End of the Beginning, which was also by Robert Valentine. And there are actually similarities between them. Like, they both start with this kind of lonely old godlike figure uh, monologuing. I thought it was really interesting. He's one of the interesting, kind of more recent writers Big Finish have picked up lately. He did that Lovecraft story with Colin Baker's Doctor. I think. Oh, he's, he's a pretty interesting new find, yeah. And then it's like Loom said... Like, I'm probably going to mangle the pronunciation. It is it is kind of like Skirzo, not Skirzo, whatever. It is. <laughs> uh, it is it is kind of like it, uh, not just in the sense of having two characters, but I mean, I saw, uh, I guess, like the internality of it, and that it's like just two people kind of in a strange ethereal landscape. A lot of it, they're talking about their emotions. Yeah, I've seen a few people making that comparison on Twitter. Yeah, it's not Rob Shearman, <laughs> you know, writing it, so it's like... I might temper that a little bit, but it's it's a similar vibe, which is nice to have, like a very internal kind of story. There's there's no kind of major villain, like a Dalek or anything. Having an excuse to have David Tennant act against himself. Yeah. It reminds me of, um, as in Dalek and Human Nature, the TV show is based off of Jubilee or the book. This is maybe what New Who would do to a Scurzo story. Mm. Yeah. Oh, that's an interesting perspective. The only thing I knew about this one going in was that it was Ten's... Uh, I think it's I think it's Shearso. I'm going to go with Shearso. Uh, and Have we all pronounced it something different now? <laughs> <laughs> it definitely didn't live up to that, uh, to that particular hype, I think, uh, just for me. Because I was like, oh my gosh, I'm really excited. And then there was like a lot of... Um, I loved the introspection, you know, that kind of... The, the middle and end but I thought there, there was a huge chunk of this with um, like spaceship mechanics yeah yeah there's a lot of technobabble 
tachyon particles in them. Yeah, the malfunctioning ship at the beginning, and then when they salvage that ship that crashed. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it, it was a- lots of wondering about for a bit. At 18 minutes in, when they find the foley, because I follow along the time as I'm listening, I was like thinking, I, I don't, I don't get how this is the um, <laughs> this is this is the Scherzo story yet. Like it's. It's 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 fine. Like we've had good dialogue between Anya and the Doctor, but it's like they're just wandering around and talking about the spaceship so far. Like it, it got good towards the end. It got uh, very interesting for sure. But I think Scurzo is pretty hardcore pretty much the whole way through. Whereas this was a little bit mechanical at the start, just setting up kind of the logistics of everything for like a third of the story. Without spoiling Scurzo, Scurzo happens at a particular point in the relationship between the Doctor and Companion, and you couldn't do that after six episodes. Yeah, that's true. I think I, all, I almost would have... I hate to be like, they should have done this for the story. I, I find that kind of a cheap way to talk about things. But that said, I'm going to do it anyway. I would have liked if they were talking <laughs> about Mark. This is so hypocritical. I was just complaining about over-explanations in the earlier stories and speaking too much to things. But I kind of would have preferred if it was more straight up about Mark's death from the get-go. Purely because I would have preferred getting into the character stuff earlier and not kind of doing the exploring and logistic stuff so much for like like a 18 minutes. But we eventually got there, I guess, is what the important thing is. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, there were definitely some stones left unturned in the introspective part. Like, I could have listened to another hour of... Yeah. Um, well, maybe maybe an hour is a little much, but uh, I could have listened to another hour of Ten and Anya each being kind of tormented with facts about each other, with confronted yeah. with their own, you know, Ten's hypocrisy could have come into play right there. Um, there there's a lot of there's a lot of different directions that could have gone, and uh, and sacrificing some of the exploration time for some more of that would have been a worthwhile change in my opinion but i do think well it'll be a shame if this is the only real introspective like the only time that the characters and the writers take a chance to really delve deeply into the thoughts of these characters because while this was like a really banner story i hope that going into the third box set with all the different moving set pieces and all that they don't go Oh, this is, you know, we, we covered all the, the character stuff. You know, we don't really need to delve into that anymore. Mm. It shouldn't be an obligation. It should be like the interest in, you know, telling stories like this in general is to explore the characters. Exactly. Yeah. Because the Doctor and Anya, I think, is the most interesting part of this, um, these box sets. I think while it was, it's an odd sort of premise to have, um, you know, such a big finishy character. Yeah being so intrinsic to it but it's also yeah i think they're in a great place to have this introspection and there's a lot of interesting conflict and secrets they've been keeping and yeah i think i'm i'm still not as i think invested in anya as maybe you guys but that said the fact that she's not a companion like he's had before the 10th doctor or we've gotten on you know the revived series at all is really cool that's something Mm. Um, so much more interesting to me than the kind of companions we often get, which are just in the model of like a of a revived series companion. So that's it, yeah, it's a very interesting thing um, to have their relationship be what it is. Uh, it's so it's it's halfway through this episode where we get kind of what I feel is like the uh, driving drama of it, which is the dilemma that the portal only one person can go through it. And then they have the choice to bring the lost with them or not. But two regular folks, Anya and the Doctor, can't both go through it. And so, of course, this isn't like a malicious thing of, ooh, I want to push you out of the way and go through it myself. It's the reverse where they're both like, no, you should do it. You know, like you have a better reason to um, go forth back into the universe than me. And then I like how that spins out into characterizing both of them more and probing it more deeply than... Oh, the Doctor's a good guy. You know how he wants to send Anya through. I, it's, it, I feel like that's a good way to set up the characters. That puts it all in the back half of the story as well. So, yeah, that's how it's structured. Why is it that when everything hits rock bottom, I end up talking to myself? I thought it a good idea to take the appearance of one you're more likely to listen to. Ouch! Am I really that egocentric? 
Yes, Doctor. You are. And your willingness to sacrifice your life is more vanity than true selflessness. Don't try that one on me. I am not lying, though. Am I? Explicitly calling that vanity on the Doctor's part was quite interesting. Yeah. Again, very in tune with the kind of special year 10. It reminded me of what finally does him in, in the end of time. With Welf and that kind of yeah. debate yeah, where yeah. Welf is like, totally. no, 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 you're so much more important. So that was kind of neat to see. And it's definitely something that I feel like fits in this era of Ten's life. Like if it was after Planet of the Dead or Waters of Mars, especially, uh, you know, that's something that the, the comics have revisited, that decision with Welf. Or like, oh, ten, Time Lord Victorious Ten would not have sacrificed himself for wealth, and he would not have sacrificed himself for Anya. So it was really great to see him. It would have been easy to kind of go like, oh, what if the Doctor is really tempted by this? But he shuts it down pretty quick. Yeah, yeah. Mm. It's yeah, it's an inter- it's interesting to look at that as like, it's easier for him to have it as the kind of sacrificial way where he gives himself up and he saves the day for his companion whereas kind of putting it in that pragmatic sense of well aren't lots more people gonna die you're the doctor like in this kind of meta sense we know you can save the day for millions of people that's more more of an interesting conflict to me at least after time lord victorious and all the other stuff which explored this more outright selfish 10th doctor to get this other way to look at the kind of him not looking at things pragmatically back when he was more kind of mellowed out and not straightforwardly selfish. Mm-hmm. I love that Anya taking the uh, agency in the final decision and choosing to sacrifice herself against the Doctor's wishes. Yeah. I sh- Well, I should say I misunderstood the ending at first, but I think in a kind of cool way. So what happened... We like the story starts with this little prologue bit of the actual lost himself getting lost or whatever, like all these other people play by the same actor, like saying, Oh, you know, you suck, you're not singing the song of the maker or whatever, out with you, off with your head, all that kind of stuff. <laughs> uh, but that's so disconnected from the Anya 10th Doctor drama that I straight up forgot that as the story went on. Yeah, and so then towards the end, when we have the two doctors thing and the f- present Doctor goes and he saves the day by going back to the past Doctor and he shunts off all the discharge from the timey wiminess into, you know, his aborted timeline and then the past Doctor goes and lives on fine. I misinterpreted this as being like a Moff-esque or shaman esque like, causal loop where then that person gets stuck in the bubble and then, you know, a millennia later they're consumed by all their darkness inside and they become the lost and then that's why when he was talking to the doctor he was psychoanalyzing himself so well and everything um and then when the story ended my player looped it back to the start and it played the opening again with the actual lost guy and i was like oh it's so that's (laughs) that isn't what happened it was an actual guy (laughs) that would have been a really interesting and kind of dark direction to take it in though that's uh that that's I love when the when the misunderstanding or the misinterpretation <laughs> yeah. is uh, sometimes more interesting. Yeah, <laughs> I feel like I'm set up for that because I don't I don't think Rob Valentine does, but John Dorney often really goes in for very straight up doing like Moffat types of stories, and so yeah. and you know Rob Sheeman stuff gets mined a lot as well. So I guess I'm just kind of primed to think the autos would do like a loop like that. But it was I thought it was mm. a really interesting way to characterize. Uh, the Doctor like that. I don't know if it would have been better. Um, but yeah, it was kind of abrupt for me to remember. Oh, there was a disc... The Lost was an actual dude. Mm-hmm. It was still making me think of Muffet. Just, I mean, making me think of Heaven Sent with the Anya and the Tenth Doctor that we're with for the whole story actually dying. And It's a very Doctory thing to the Doctor to save the day for themselves or the Doctor to save another Doctor. It's all very interesting still, for sure. Yeah. But yeah, your version does sound cool as well. <laughs> Uh, one th- weird note was when the Lost is asking how much the Doctor's loyalty to Anya is really to 70s Anne, I think that kind of rang less well for me than it might have otherwise because the previous story of Dorney's was doing such a good job making Anya, Mark, and the Doctor feel like a proper team that it's like, well, I just heard, <laughs> you know, them all be pretty loyal and friendly to each other. So 
if not for that story that was actually doing a good job of characterizing them all together i would have felt this note more strongly of oh does the doctor like anya at all maybe it's all just for Anne. yeah as much as they say that it's a standalone series that can be enjoyed by casual fans because I, that's definitely what i go into like okay how would the not we if i gave this to like my brother uh or my mom i guess right what would they think of this would they be able to get it and I thought that the fact that so much of this story hinged on the 1970s stuff, and also, uh, of course, Sarah, Sarah Kingdom, right? Which is a real deep pull from a story that doesn't even <laughs> survive fully yeah. visually. Um, that that's rather than focusing on Mark, something that just happened. I love this story. I love the story. I love the introspection. I love the characters. But it's not something that I think I would be able to... I'd have to give a long rundown of, <laughs> of stuff that like they haven't seen uh, for them to really appreciate what's going on in this, especially since it's really the first mention of the Doctor's experience with Sarah Kingdom and all that. Like, if you didn't know that going in, when all of them were mentioned in the House of Kingdom episode, there I don't I don't think you would get an inkling that the Doctor was involved. I don't think they mentioned that. It's like they do they don't like they don't leave us entirely in the dark. Like they do recap some things and they have like explanations and stuff. But I feel like those feel kind of like obligatory things to me because you can explain oh the Doctor was close to so and so and the Doctor actually did so and so and that's all fine, but. If it's just an explanation, there's no... It's not really building your brain. It's not emotionally linking with anything. And so it makes later moments are going to fall flat. Even if you, like, can mechanically remember, oh, so they're reacting that way because the Doctor supposedly did this. You didn't hear them do that. With the Daleks' master plan stuff, you can't even see them do some of that. <laughs> so it's it's like... I don't, I don't think, like, they're incompetently not even explaining to you the foundations you need necessarily but i feel like For it's sure. not enough For to sure. explain it because where is the yeah. attachment coming from and so you're going to kind of get alienated from parts of these stories potentially just because even if they give you the tools to understand understanding isn't feeling yeah i'm gonna have to cough up the i'm gonna have to listen to those fourth doctor series <laughs> before the third <laughs> box i think I'd, i have to do that to myself um so I think this is part of the plan. It's 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 like yeah. they, they want you to go out and buy these other stories. Like Rivers in the next one, and she has another story with Mark Kingdom in a River Song box set. So they want you to buy that eighth box set, and then maybe you'll buy the other seven. Oh. So it's all it's all very um, yep. Marvel or whatever you want to call it. I think, but I think they're kind of torn because even though they're not like the BBC or the actual charter to say you can't make someone need to absorb something else, I think they don't want to be too harsh to people and like straight up that you need to have listened to this other thing but i think that just kind of makes some confusion then because then people are like oh, am i meant to listen to this thing well maybe like you don't have to but it would be a good idea and it's just kind of this halfway point where some people might feel kind of on the outside and are like i can listen to this without hearing the syndicate master plan or whatever but you want me to like mm -hmm. it's I, I think sometimes especially with how like People like John Dornery or James Goss talk about it on Twitter. Like, I think they're very much not saying, yes, fans, we need to buy this. They're never like that. But there's this kind of confusion because they're not really committing. You're still including all this stuff from these other box sets. So even though you're explaining it, like you are still leaning. Of course, they'd like you to buy them. So I think it's this kind of hazy area for sure. We saw that so much with Time Lord Victorious. Yeah. Yeah, because I think it'd be bad for business if oh yeah there were all these prerequisites that fans might put off buying down the universe because they think well I need to listen to all this stuff yeah. first so they can't really I think they know they can't say oh you need to buy this but maybe they kind of think you should <laughs> yeah and I think it also because it, there's kind of a self selection element if you ask someone online do I need to have listened to X to listen to Y the most likely people to answer you are people who care about audio dramas enough that they probably have listened to all that other stuff. Yeah. So there's this self-selection thing where they might be the type of person to tell you, well, hell yeah, you need to have listened. Then you'll get the emotional engagement from, you know, beat XYZ in this story better if you've listened to these other 12 hours. And you're not going to... The people who 
haven't listened to those and like, well, I was fine. Just listening to this, they're probably going to be less inclined to be searching forums to reply to those questions in the first place, which I think is a big part of yeah. how this whole discourse around this works. It can go in the other direction too. I've run into that with, uh, with talking to people about Faction Paradox. They're like, oh, can I just jump in and read this book? And I'm like, yeah, I think, I think you'd be able to enjoy the Breakspear Voyage without any background. And I'm like scratching my head and I'm like, yeah, no, I think, I think that'll make sense. But of course, since I didn't experience it in that order, since I had heard the background, that doesn't actually work. And they'll come back and be like, well, what the heck was yeah. all this about? Yeah. I'm like, oh, <laughs> yeah, sorry. I kind of forgot that you didn't know that. Um, so it can, it can cut both yeah, ways. It's, it's tricky for sure. Yeah. And I, I guess on that note of interconnectivity, we have this bit in this story where uh, it, there's talk of, you know, companions and we get some TV ones listed off, Sarah Kingdom, Adric, Donna, Gallifrey, Rose and the other universe. But we also get, do we call these audio spoilers? Because there's two names of audio characters and they're not in ranges connected to the 10th Doctor at all. I'm of two minds. On one hand, it's cool to have like... <laughs> And a tenth Doctor conversation that's validating. It's very Night of the Doctor esque. Yeah, yeah. It really like it's like what that thing we're talking about. How weird it is that it's a tenth Doctor story, which would be entry level for a lot of people. That's dealing with Terry Nation stuff. There's a lot of big Finnish fans would know face, but a lot of new tenth Doctor fans obviously wouldn't. It's a weird clash. I don't want people to know that if they're going to go listen to series like ideally someone should maybe a kind of blind into that but it's a huge event in the doctor's life so i get why it's referenced elsewhere but yeah that felt that yeah. felt a bit weird to me i think ultimately i prefer them to have that just because i'd be thinking well why didn't they mention if they're big finish you know we get enough of it on tv where we don't get big finish references yeah, that's you know quite rightly but yeah. yeah i think i just prefer having this moment of indication it's, it's even think. possible that um we're thinking with fan brain here of like trying to imagine what a noob might think. Whereas someone might listen to this and go, oh, an audio yeah. person, who's this? I'll go Google this name. Oh, that's hardcore. I'm going to listen to these stories now. Yeah. Yeah. Or like, will they even care? Is it just a throwaway name to them? Yeah. I'm, I'm, I think it's such an um, entrenched fan thing to kind of obsess over what would the not we think? How would they experience this stuff? I don't know. <laughs> you know, it's too far outside mm. my experience at this point. So I think worrying about it too much is probably not wise. But yeah, it did it did make me pause. I mean, I liked it in the moment, and then afterwards I was thinking, "Ooh, that's would that be rough?" Yeah, it's interesting to think about, but at the same time, it's like you know, I think it's better for me. Yeah, personally, this way. Well, and I think that I think that it doesn't. I think <laughs> doesn't really suffer from some dramatic irony. You know, like knowing that that's coming, especially in a list with Donna and. If you look at the um, yeah, if you look at the Doctor Who magazine illustration of the this episode, which I'm looking at right now, they have all kinds of faces in here. I mean, I don't even know what some of these faces yeah. are. I, I guess I'm not mm. a good enough fan, right? I haven't I haven't <laughs> consumed enough uh, Doctor Who yet, but you know, it's it leaves it a little ambiguous. Oh, something bad happens. And having that going into the series, I don't think that necessarily takes anything away. Because, like, Rose, you know, she's just, she's not dead. Yeah. Don is not dead, obviously, you what, said. What, like, what we're doing is the thing that happens, like, if, like, a set picture leaks out of a movie and all the fans are like, no, you can't see this. I can't believe you saw this. And, like, the normal <laughs> person would be like, I don't know what I'm seeing. This is just, I don't recognize these people. But because the fans overreact, they are, have then actually spoiled it. Whereas... It would just be a contextless thing for a, a not we. Yeah. In this list, yeah, you're totally right. Rose and Donna aren't dead, saying some negative thing happened. But for, you know, if we were going to not we go, no, I can't believe you heard that. I'm so sorry that you've had these ruined for you and you can't listen to them now. Yeah. Like, that's that's actually us doing it, <laughs> you know, not the audio. Yeah. It's just fan brain. It's so easy to fall into. Okay, there's a line that um the Doctor says here. I literally don't understand it, so I need one of you guys to explain to me. When he tells Anya... He never told her about the whole kingdom stuff because he never had a day with her worth ruining. This is like a Bilbo Baggins-esque thing where I can't tell if that's a compliment or an insult. What does this mean? <laughs> Why didn't you tell me? About what? About Brett and Sarah. You want to talk about that now? Yes. 
Okay, well, um, I suppose there was never a day I spent with you worth ruining by bringing it up. <gasps> what kind of an answer is that? The truth. I think it was like a... I, just, I took it personally as like, he just didn't want to spoil the moment kind of thing. Like, he didn't want to make everything about that because it would kind of have to be a big thing. Yeah, given that they've had back-to-back-to-back adventures, or at least that's how I've perceived yeah. the passage of time through these stories. Um, and I also don't know her whole story with the fourth Doctor, um, but I took it as him saying, oh, there was never a day where we had the emotional bandwidth or that it wouldn't have just totally ruined everything if I brought up something so unpleasant. So basically, same as uh, same as what Dil just said. I've never had a day with you worth... Like that, just that the way that is phrased makes me feel, is he like is he dissing her? It's such a kind of odd way to phrase it. But yeah, I, I get what you guys are saying. <laughs> so, what, what are, he's, there was a couple of interesting exchanges there. I liked. May, this might be me misinterpreting the story again. When the doctor says he has blood on his hands, but what doctor hasn't? I'm assuming this is like a medical doctor thing, and he's just like kind of making a wider point that part of saving people is losing people. That's just part of what happens. Yeah, just like the doctor in the general yeah, sense. I'm, I'm like glad I'm not doctoring. This isn't like a reference to ten other stories or something with actual capital Z doctors. Imagine he said like, "Oh, but the fifth doctor <laughs> also, you know." <laughs> <laughs> They should do a whole series where the doctor is working in a hospital, <laughs> like a nice Grey's Anatomy <laughs> spinoff. That's what that's what this is a reference to. Uh, emergency temporal shift is another big RTD callback thing. That's the classic Dalek ex machina thing they would say before vanishing out of the end of a story. Uh, so for that to be a big plot point here, I mean, I I never like these huge techno babble spiels that are like all the mechanics of the ending revolve around. But at least it was like words I knew, <laughs> you, you know, it was a concept I knew mm-hmm. from the show. And they set it up well by mentioning in the previous story that it was like Dalek technology, yeah. or it was the Dalek way of time travel yeah. that they were... Yeah, exactly. So, the Doctor wasn't saving himself, but he was being the Doctor. So, he wasn't literally saving that version of himself, but he was saving the version of himself from a few hours ago. Right, I've understood this right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah that was a nice Moffatism. Although, given that they end up with the memories of their other selves, uh, somehow, uh, mm. I'm not really sure if there's, like... That's Heaven Sent-esque again. Yeah. I, was, I, I wasn't thinking that. I was thinking your other favourite story, uh, Journey to Center to Tardis. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I'm fine with this kind of fairy tale. Memories are just floating around in the air, man, kind of thing. It's it's very kind of lyrical. It It works for me. Yeah. Because it's it's also timey wimey that I kind of this concept it's so it's a insane concept really that memories are like radiation that are like permeating through the air. It sounds weird to try and explain it, but in terms of the actual stories, it it always just works for me. It clicks. It makes some sort of sense to me. It's yeah, it's very much like the tail end of series five. If, if it can be remembered, it can be brought back. It, it, it's if you if, if a time traveler his memories can't be erased or whatever. Functionally, you don't want all this episode should just be a waste of time that like you want them to remember. <laughs> I think it works on that meta sense because we've just experienced an hour. It's alienating if the characters somehow lose that hour. Yeah, I love these endings where it's like uh, the doc- it is kind of Series 5-esque. The Doctor goes back and he warps around the timeline to shunt off another Doctor to die. It's, it's kind of like the girl who waited with the other Amy. I, I, yeah, I think, it, I think mm-hmm. it's a really cool mm-hmm. storytelling move. That's a great comparison. And and I, and I like because it keeps the sanctity of Anya did die. Uh, it's not that she was brought back; it's just we go back. So it kind of it doesn't undo yeah. this character did this. They still have their agency of doing that. Mm-hmm. It's just we as the listeners then move on to another track where something else happened, but it doesn't undo that she did this. So I think it's a cool timey wimey move. This kind of thing. I was just gonna say it's a shocking emotional beat, but then also kind of having your cake and eating it like. <laughs> <laughs> it's it, it would annoy me like how I as a kid I disliked how much series two was setting up Rose is gonna die and then it's like oh well she was on the list of the dead <laughs> it's like yeah it's like <laughs> you know what you were doing and you know that's like a cheap way out of it but here there was nothing like mm. setting up 
Anya is totally going to die. Like, we got this dilemma. The Lost says only one of them can go through the portal, but they both express doubt sometimes. They're saying, well, he, they could be lying to us. There's never, like, the story didn't start with a cold mm-hmm. open of, at the end, Anya about to die, saying, I'm dying forever and it'll never be undone. So it doesn't it doesn't feel off to me <laughs> to do the timey wimey yeah. thing because Anya dying was just a natural way the story developed and it wasn't something the story kept promoting to us or marketing to us or pushing at us. This is totally happening for real and forever. Which is, I think, more when people take issue with timey wimey stuff. I don't think it's because of the timey wimeyness itself so much as you led me to believe this was valid and set in stone and then it wasn't, I think, is what annoys people more. Yeah, and even though now she's not technically dead it still shows us that she would do that so it's cool yeah so how do you how does this episode reorient their relationship with each other so they both remember it how do you think they both feel about each other now well there's a promising thing where they say they've got a lot to talk about yeah hopefully they'll um we don't see actually follow through with that in the third (laughs) in the third (laughs) box yeah i i think it was maybe the best way to get I, I don't know why they left the whole Sarah Kingdom thing dangling. Yeah. Uh, like, starting at the beginning, even. Like, th- they could have started out their relationship knowing this about each other. They were already distrusting each other at the beginning. Adding this now, I guess, goes to show how much they do trust each other. Because her reaction to it isn't that long, yeah. really. She's like, what the heck, why didn't you tell me this? And he's like, ah... And she's like, yeah, okay, good enough. I'll still, you know, sacrifice myself for you and all that. Uh, which yeah. I appreciated. I thought that was well done. I'm glad they didn't turn it into this huge thing. But, she's not, um, like, upset about the actual event. It's more just, she's like, why didn't you tell me? Like, I, Well, I think part of this, I don't mean this in a rude way to Rose or Martha. Uh, Anya is older than most of the Tenth Doctor companions. Uh, older than Donna, uh, even, I'm pretty sure. And I think it rings true to me just to have more emotional maturity in general. Like, she's lived a life. She's been through a lot of stuff before. She's not going to, like, blow off her... She's not going to fly off the handle at, you know, being lied to. She's going to be annoyed. But she's too mature and too developed in general. She's lived through too many things, I think, to have this kind of petulant reaction. reaction, Which could be, you know, totally well-deserved for the Doctor. Like, he screwed up. Yeah, but it rings very true to me that she's just like... They they, they both know he, he screwed up. It's not like this huge, you know, sad pop song playing and they walk away. No, I didn't have time to explain kind of thing. It's like, I, I like that it feels mature and it feels refreshing, which means it feels different from the TV show, which feels cool because then it feels more like its own bespoke series. So, yeah, that totally worked for me. Totally, yeah. But I guess it is kind of <laughs> inherently undramatic, all that said. Yeah, because I found... Because I like... On one hand, I did have issue in the first box there with her kind of passive nature when it comes to, like, the Doctor being a, basically a dick to her about yeah, and Kelso. Yeah. But on mm. the other hand, there's also issue being passive or is she just kind of... Is it just emotional maturity? Yeah. Like, well, will it even be brought up again? That's the thing, isn't it? A lot of this is going to depend on the river story we've got a cliffhanger now for the next box set and by the looks of it the next three stories are going to just run into each other yeah i'm hopeful that going forward they're gonna trust each other you know i hope we still get character moments where it's like oh yeah they're actually thinking about the character it's not just you do this you do that um I mean, obviously i trust the writers to do that maybe not obviously but i do um we'll see because all the 70s stuff, the distrust, the Sarah kingdom, the, oh, I'm not sure where we stand with each other. I'm hoping that all that is gone. And maybe hoping is not the right word. I'm expecting that all that is gone so that going forward they can just treat her like any other companion and it doesn't get in the way of telling the big stories that they're leading up to. Yeah. Yeah, I think the Doctor's been more honest with her really than any other companion that he's had. Rose and Martha and Donna. Why do you think that is? Is it... I don't think it's just the age thing, because... Well, I guess Donna was older than Rose and Martha, but she was also kind of stunted in life. That was part of her whole character, you know, living with her parents and kind of in a dead-end state in life. Anya, (laughs) very much not that. She's a big, you know, hotshot agent. Uh, She's she's made a, a name for herself and everything. Is it 
That, like, why, why does the Tenth Doctor just kind of vibe with her more? Even though he obviously resents the Anne... Well, even though there's issues with the whole Anne thing, why is he kind of more open with her in that way? I guess because he's... Because he doesn't feel like he's that invested in her relationship. Like, he's... Like, he doesn't really th- feel like he sh- has to care about her, so he's just... He can be more yeah. open. He's not, like, trying to guard himself, like put on a sort of front like he would with you know, Rose or something. Yeah, he doesn't have that duty of care. He can just go for it. Yeah, it's like, well, there's mm. there's a lot of those beats in all three stories where they kind of, you know, and even Mark, you know, they all kind of fight a bit. Well, well I want to go do this, you go do that. And then they just basically go, okay, you know what you're doing. We get a, we, like in the very first story with the bears, I think there's that moment where they're like, well, you guys are professional travelers. You know, you, you aren't helpless companions okay, you go do what you think is best. Which I think mm. I do think it is kind of undramatic, and this is why the TV show doesn't tend to do it. But it's refreshing. You know, it's an audio series. They can play around a bit more uh, with stuff like that. I noted down the line there, which I liked, is um, where he says, I suppose I'm just more used to livable amateur adventurers yeah. than action space security agents. I like that. Like, is this less fun for him? I think so. Uh, but I don't. Th- I don't think he's not enjoying it. But I think this is why he doesn't usually do it like this, unless it's like a Clara thing where there's so much emotional stuff going on there. Even though they're both, you know, similar levels of capability. But here, yeah, I think it's mm. just a. I don't think he would have normally done this, but I think he's in a kind of wishy-washy state after uh, Journey's End. Yeah. What do you think of the actual? Lost, like, I wasn't that big on this because I literally forgot it as I was listening, but the actual, oh, you were causing discord and the cosmic harmony, you wanted your name exalted, you are the lost. What's the deal with all this stuff? I honestly would have preferred if they left it unexplained. Same. It yeah, fe- it, just, just a yeah. weird cosmic thing. It didn't yeah. add anything. Like, it's vague. Yeah, the doctor himself does a good enough job saying... Oh, the whole universe is full of these things. They just, they think they're gods, this, that, and the other thing. Yeah. More of a midnighty thing where it's just like, why is this entity imprisoned in a bubble? Who imprisoned it? Why? How long? It doesn't remember. I think that would have been cooler. Yeah. And it it doesn't matter at the end of the day. It's Especially since it didn't seem to remember that backstory. Yeah, so why did we get it? You know, like it, exactly, exactly. You pride yourself on being the doctor. The man who cures. The man who saves. It's who I am. Then be that man and save the two of us. If you let it, that pride of yours will stop you from doing what must be done. You must return to the universe, Doctor. You know that. You know the threat it faces. The danger to come. How can you consider throwing away your life in stubborn defiance when you are the only one who can save it? I don't know that, and I won't sacrifice Anya. You can't trust Anya. My final thoughts on The Lost would be that I agree with a lot of the praise for it. I think it's lovely and evocative and atmospheric. I love that it's so focused on character. I like the melancholy vibe. There are some great lines in it. I love trying to puncture the Doctor, Tenet's Doctor in particular, their self-evident goodness. I love kind of analysing that further and how the Doctor's vanity intersects with it all. And just the concept of the story alone, a character-focused story in a collapsing bubble dimension where a Doctor and companion have a rift drawn between them while a shape-shifting kind of quasi-deity plays them off each other in the guise of different characters, including themselves. It's lovely, it's imaginative, and it appeals to me a lot more than Terry Nation nostalgia or bringing out the monk, bringing out the Daleks, bringing out the mechanoids, and so on. That said, I feel like this story didn't play to what felt like its strengths to me a lot of the time. I was bothered by how much of the runtime wasn't all the things that I just praised and that I see other people praising, but instead a lot of landscape traversal type of stuff and other things that I didn't feel were fitting into the strengths so much. Some of the conflict and relationship between the Tenth Doctor and Anya still rings, if not outright untrue, then at least wonky and unintuitive to me. I love Anya and the Doctor struggling with all the what-ifs of their lives, but I struggle with the questions of loyalty here, especially since the last episode had just, to my mind and my ears, gotten the characters working quite well together. 
And the way the story framed the Doctor's tendency to sacrifice themselves, I thought it was fascinating. And a more original way than usual of poking at the Doctor's kind of general inherent goodness there. But I did kind of groan when the drama reverted back to the Doctor's beef with the whole Anne Kelso thing. Since I do continue to find that a kind of clunky source of drama, it feels so self-evidently ridiculous on the Doctor's part. And perhaps it plays better to people who've heard all those Tom Baker and Kelso stories. And I continue to love to hear from people in a different position to me in that sense. But I don't think any amount of explaining within this series is going to really get me on board. With this conflict of the 10th Doctor resenting a woman for not actually being a constructed 1970s police persona she once inhabited. But I did like the nakedness of the Doctor admitting the distinction there. Although again, I think this plays very oddly to at least this listener who hasn't heard all those Anne Kelso Tom Baker stories. I liked taking a story to explore the fallout of Mark Seven's death, especially since his death itself felt muted to me in that story, the Trojan Dalek, since real major character death isn't a common thing in Doctor Who. I suppose just as Heaven Sent enhanced and expanded our understanding of Clara's death, the fallout from it, and the Doctor's characterization in the wake of it, just as there was a whole episode kind of doing that sort of thing after Face the Raven, doing a story like this after Mark's death felt smart to me, probably my favourite structural decision of the series yet. I felt that the actual lost character themselves took away from the mystery appeal of the setting, from the story, from the vibe, and I think the story was stronger in its more ambiguous moments than something like the cold open spelling out the lost's backstory. I did love the resolution of the story. Not only was it an inventive and imaginative way to resolve the story, in a way that didn't invalidate any of the big character moments at all, but I think it also enhanced our understandings of the characters moving forward, and I'm looking forward to seeing how that develops. I love seeing Tennant get something like this on audio. Not just a well-executed story in the vein of stories Tennant has gotten on TV before, and not just an exercise in mashing up classic Who elements with Tennant's superstar New Who Doctor, but something more new for him, a story he hasn't played the likes of before, and something that, while perhaps not without flaws, Something that pushed him and his co-star in interesting ways, in an evocative space that spent a lot of time on character. What the hell is he? Oh, I don't know, an Eternal maybe? One of the Endless? I, mean, I forgot what things were like before the Time War. It's a universe full of pseudo-gods and quasi-deities, all born in the spark of creation. Beings of infinite age and formidable power, hiding in the shadows, whiling away eternity. Oh, whatever it was, I don't think it knows anymore. I liked um, that thing about him saying there were, there's all the gods, like before the time war, there was all these gods in the universe and then the Eternals fled or whatever. It's a fun way to kind of emphasise that time war division too, which I think this series is weirdly not doing much of. For like the whole premise being back before the time war, I don't feel like they're playing with it much, but that was a cool little line to that effect. Well, before the time war, yeah, there was all sorts of Zelens. Because before the time war is like... It's not just like thinking about it in universe as the time war, but also there's like a meta way. It's like the time war kind of acts as a d distinction between the new series and the classic series. Yeah, totally. That's why he's immersed in classic stuff here. Because it's not just like, yeah, it's not just like the Tempt Doctor's going before the time war. He's going into the classic series, like, and he's meeting like 80s Davos and a universe where there's Eternals and things. I'm being a hypocrite again, because I'm saying I don't want them over-explaining, but there is me saying they're not doing enough with this being before the Time War concept, when the whole thing is mm. him interfacing with the classic series. Yeah, you're totally right. Well said. I'm really surprised by how many people have such a difficulty with that idea. I saw a lot of people... There was one person in particular who was saying that his main complaint at like was that the, the storytelling didn't make any sense because he didn't understand what before the time war meant. And I was like, just, you know, take your brain out yeah. of it. Just think of it as the classic series. You know, there's all kinds of complicated. Yeah. John Dorney himself was posting on Reddit, <laughs> uh, which I love to see him using, yeah. just chatting with people outside of any kind of official capacity. Uh, and people were actually trying to argue with him, not realizing who he was. Uh, yeah. But um, I totally agree with his take on what the time war is and like, how you can't just travel in time before it. I think a good yeah. way to explain it is like it's like the the concept of the Mandela effect, mm. which is obviously like a ridiculous <laughs> thing in real life, but it, it but it's a cool concept for fiction because 
it's like the idea of some, realizing someone died, uh, of thinking someone definitely died, and you remember that vividly, but then you suddenly, suddenly they were alive the whole time, and no one else sees anything wrong. Like, even if you could time travel in that scenario, you couldn't go back to how you saw the event originally. You couldn't go back to a time when Nelson Mandela did die in the 90s or something, because now it's never happened. So you can't go back in time to it because it never happened at all. So that's how the time war is. Like, the universe is altered. What I think it is, as fans super into Doctor Who, st- or super into any property, you get fan brain. Mm. Where you start thinking about everything way too internally. And you forget the way, you forget the context that all this stuff is happening in. The time war isn't some actual crazy temporal splinter event. It never happens. Yeah, it, it's something you can put on a wiki article. It was something, mm. well... Let's not say who made it up, because that's its own... Yeah. It's something that, <laughs> you know... Someone made it up, right? Alan Moore, Lawrence Miles, RTD, someone <laughs> made, made this up. <laughs> but it's really used, at least in New Who stuff, as this kind of scar between Classic Who and Wilderness Who and the Revival series. That's what it's effectively used for in Series 1. It's clearing away all the classic continuity, but in the way that gives the Doctor a winning, exciting new characterization. That's what it's doing. And that's, if we, when we think about it this way, so much more makes sense. When we think about it as, well, yeah. what did the John Hurt Doctor do before that? And how did he become him? And how did he notice his ears if he then regenerated and he went to Rose's house? And what about that big finish story? If we, you, you lose everything if you start doing like that, because they're all stories made up to entertain yeah. you. They, these aren't, these aren't yeah. actually going to fit together. That's not how it works. They're not, chronicles of historical events there's that impulse to explain it all on yeah. wikis and stuff but it's a story i think it's this funny irony like these people on I'm, I'm sure they're total experts in doctor who and that's the problem is that they're so well versed and yeah. they're so smart about doctor who that they can they're in this doctor who world you know that they've made around themselves with their advanced understanding of these stories and in that they're in a bubble like the lost where they've lost sight of what this all actually means like mm. this is used to yeah. clear this is used for ways to approach audiences. This is used for ways to sell inventory, you know? So it's uh, beyond relatable. It happens, you know, to us all the time because we're very into Doctor Who. It's just this funny thing of Mm. when you get too into a story and you can lose sight of the logistics side. You can make it work with other franchises, Star Trek, Star Wars, where it's a linear timeline for the most part. This This event happens after this event. But with something like Doctor Who, it goes back and forth and up and down it's pointless yeah. trying to fix anything to a strict timeline on, on a big macro scale like that and I, I get it can be fun like sometimes I've had fun trying to imagine how would you order these stories like that's totally a fun thing to do it's only a danger when you get a little too into that and you start actually thinking oh how can I listen to these 10th Doctor stories made to appeal to a wild audience because I don't understand how the time war can work you know and that's when you've lost mm-hmm. um, things a bit yeah yeah the way it's, I like to see it is that any interaction the new series now has with the classic series, the time war is just there. Like, so, say the Doctor in like the Out of Time audios, he goes, he goes and he meets like, the fourth Doctor from the classic series, but that's like a fourth, fourth Doctor in the classic series that's been affected by the time war, sort of. So that's that kind of. Ex- in a meta way, it's like, you know, the fourth Doctor in the classic series didn't meet the tenth Doctor from, you know, in the 70s, obviously. It's like how Genesis has been retroactively been made to be the first shot, really, of the Time War. When it wasn't, mm. it was just a story written in 1974. It wasn't yeah. Yeah. made, wanted to connect to the 2000 series. It worked, they made it work, but that's not the design of it. The Time War makes these retroactive things work, really. Like, it's just a cool device at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. I think it's like, it's this classic big finish argument you get, which I I used to, I think I used to perhaps argue with Nate about this back in the day. And I had the wrong perspective, I believe. I remember. Yeah, <laughs> where <laughs> it was whether you should listen to um, big finish stories, in particular the monthly stories, in order of release in the real world we live in, like 1999 to 2000, 2001, or whether you should go in the internal chronology. So listen to a 2006 story <laughs> with the Eighth Doctor first, and then, you know, a 2002 story with the Eighth Doctor, because that's the internal 
chronology. And I still think it can be fun to do that. It can be fun to immerse yourself so much in the fiction of a world totally. that, like, you know that this stuff came later. Like, you know if you watched The Day of the Doctor Before Rose because the War Doctor regenerates, this is a reverse imposition you're doing. Christopher Eccleston's performance cannot be informed by John Hurt. But it can be fun to, you know, very imaginatively yeah. immerse yourself in the construct of it and enjoy it in that way. It's fun, but it's not, I mean, it's not theological. This isn't how it actually worked. You, you know, if you listen to it in real life order, you actually mm -hmm. see how these concepts built up. You see how these writers affected other writers. And you actually, because it's like we said earlier with how we project how we remember characters back onto them. So like the 10th Doctor and the 50th isn't quite in terms of his you know, fiction timeline, perhaps how he would be, but he's how we remember him in 2013. That's our memories of the 10th Doctor. Mm. And so it makes more sense to me to listen to things in real life release order because that that's how we work. That's how humans work is, you know. Yeah. Memory is a very wibbly-wobbly, timey-wimey thing and how it affects stories written later. A story, a story about Tom Baker written <laughs> this year, even if it's set in between two 70s stories, it's informed by so much that didn't happen between those two 70s stories. And it's yeah. still, it's a 2020 story, really. Exactly. That's yes. And so that, that's the fun stuff of the Time War is a very mm -hmm. kind of cool representation of this kind of thing. Yeah, totally, yeah. I just love that meta kind of thing, you know. And that's something that fits in with this kind of revisitation of Terry Nation very well. Because, you know, it's fun to fit this into the Tenth Doctor's timeline, but it's also interesting to think about it in terms of all the Dalek concepts that we're exploring in this, or the Big Finish is exploring in this series that haven't been visited since the 1960s, the 1970s. Um, it's really great to hear Mark Seven in audio, for instance. Um, but at the same time, it would make no sense to try to go back and insert this in between the, you know, the Mark Seven yeah. annuals. Not just because he dies, but like for other reasons as well. It's like it's almost. I've not read much Grant Morrison, but from what I've the hypertime stuff. Yeah, it's very similar to that. This like literalizing this kind of interaction between the real world writing yeah you know our our timeline and like the fictional timeline i think yeah like you said earlier doctor who just lends itself to this stuff so i mean grant morrison's obsessed with that kind of thing mm. that's probably one of the reasons he likes doctor who so much yeah the doctor who inherently because it's all built about contradictions and rewriting itself all the time and skipping around there's no yeah, like Loom said, there's no Star Wars or Marvel type continuity where it's kind of meant to be coherent. Doctor Who, it's like the whole Atlantis destroyed three different ways things in, in classic Who thing. It's mm -hmm. it's built on contradictions. That's the fun of it. The Time Wars there is a tool for you to, you know, have fun imagining why a contradiction is there. It's 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 part of, it's part of the joy yeah. Yeah. of Doctor Who to me is that the contradictions are all embraced. Everything matters. Everything counts. Yeah, it's great. Alrighty, and so that was Dalek Universe 2. As with the first box set, I think it's interesting to really engage with this series, to treat it as the David Tennant series of Doctor Who it's been promoted as, and I've had fun approaching it in that vein with you guys. As always, I'm super duper interested in the thoughts of anyone else who has listened as well, so do please feel free to comment away with any type of thoughts. And 2021's October will see the third box set release, which we will, of course, discuss as well. Thank you for taking the time to listen.